nous invitons à participer au colloque Africa 2020 qui débutera dans quelques instants dans l'auditorium de la Fondation. Nous vous souhaitons un agréable moment. Mesdames, Messieurs, bienvenue à l'auditorium de la Fondation Louis Vuitton. To the Louis Vuitton Le collège va bientôt Auditorium. commencer. Nous vous demandons de bien vouloir soon. éteindre vos téléphones portables, sure de garder vos masques et de respecter les gestes barrières on, en quittant votre place à l'issue du colloque. Nous vous souhaitons un agréable moment. We hope you enjoy your time here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fondation Louis Vuitton Auditorium. The symposium will soon begin. We ask you to please turn off your cell phone, keep your mask on correctly, and respect preventive measures while leaving your seat when the symposium has finished. We hope you enjoy the event. Bonjour. Oui, on m'entend. Bonjour à tous et à Can everyone hear me? Si nombreux, enfin, si nombreux, It's pas encore suffisamment nombreux, mais je pense que la salle est remplie. So many of you here, and even more people are filtering in as I speak. We're very happy to be with you here at the auditorium for the Louis Vuitton Foundation. We're here to talk all about artistic initiatives in Africa. This is a symposium that we organize as part of our Africa 2020 season that we're very happy to be part of. By African artists, we mean projects that are being developed by artists, plastic artists in the visual arts in a country belonging to the African continent. As you'll see with our guests, these projects can be different, of different sorts, festivals, residencies, expos, temporal art. And the special edition of the journal that we handed out at the entrance to the auditorium will show you the full range of diversity of the project. We tried to get as many of this type of initiative as possible into that publication. The agenda for today that we set up with Elvira Diangi Oze, who is sat to your left over there on the stage. She's the head of the showroom in London and the new head of the Magba in Barcelona. So this is all about a focus on six of these initiatives. These have been developed by the six artists that you can see 
marketing Alors, en front of you. Alors, en commençant par la gauche, Sami Baloji. We've got Sami Baloji, who founded the Pisha Association, working out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Then we have Zineb Sidira from Alger. Then we have Aida Murene, from the Addis Photo Fest in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Barthélemy Chogo from Banjul Station, Banjul in Cameroon. Moataz Naz from Darb 1718 in Cairo, Egypt. And Fida Danawabira, who created an Ngelele Art Station in Harare in Zimbabwe. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is joining us here on stage today, first of all for accepting our invitation and also for being here in person despite all of the issues that this may have led to given the current environment and travel restrictions. I'd like to give the floor first of all to Elvira, who is going to briefly introduce the event before giving the floor to each of the artists who will be briefly introducing their own initiative and then after a short 10 minute break, We'll move on to a discussion. This will be moderated by Elvira and will be all about the goals of these projects. But let's start with Ngoni Foul, who is the commissioner for the Africa 2020 season. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here in person or maybe tuning in online. This discussion is also being broadcast and will be made available on the YouTube channel for the Louis Vuitton Foundation in French and also in English. As Ludovic said, my name is Ngoné Fall. I am the Commissioner for the Independent Expo. This started in last December and will be wrapping up in a few days on the 30th of September. This was important as part of this season, which is all about 13 major 21st century issues from knowledge sharing to wealth distribution, economic emancipation, memorialization, archiving, citizenship, etc. So it's very important to take moments to listen to each other and to understand the players acting for change in that huge continent with more than 1.2 billion people. With Ludovic and Elvira, we have been working on this format for two years now. And it was important to me to give the floor to these amazing people. Thank you, Sami. Thank you, Aida. Thank you, Zineb. Thank you, Barthélemy. Thank you, Moataz. And thank you, Dana. These are artists that I've known for a long time now. And they have, out of pocket, because we don't generally have funding of the arts in our countries, these are people who made the citizen commitment to creating platforms for production, for sharing, to make stories, and to give life to imagination in a way that has changed the ecosystem on the continent over the last two decades. Thank you also to Elvira. I've known you for a very long time. And thank you for being on board from the very beginning and for heading up this project. This was supposed to happen on the 4th of September 2020, but because of COVID, it got delayed an entire year later, just a few days before the end of the adventure. Thank you, everyone. I think we're going to dream alongside you, and you're going to give a lot of inspiration to the people here and at home. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, bienvenue. Welcome. Um, I'm very excited to be here, not only because uh, it means the fruition, the finally to take to a space in real life, IRL, <laughs> uh, to these discussions that we start today, but as we were reminded uh, by our hacks in our conversations during lunch, we have been uh, known each other for more than 20 years and, and have met in the past uh, two decades. Uh, uh, not only among ourselves, but also engaging with different local ecosystems. In fact, Ngonefol, who I'm also grateful to have invited me or to have thought of me together with uh, the Fundación Louis Vuitton, which I also, uh, we all thank for having us here today. Uh, about the possibility to continue the dialogue that we have had, as I said, for over two decades, uh, to talk about what it means to produce within a context, 
to talk about what it means to build with others a social imaginary affected by art, formulated through art, inter interrogated and questioned through art. And I wanted just to um, use um, Suleiman Bashir Diang quote, um, who is quoting at the same time Senghor on around ideas about how um, are in, um, in some African societies, it is social, right? And it's this idea that he mentions as he reminds us that African art is social in the sense that the artisan, the poet, situated and engaged along with herself or himself, their ethnic group, the history, the geography, the creation of significant forms, a give life to certain ceremonies and rituals in which the object that causes fulfill their function, right? And I, and I think when he talks about this, quoting, as I said, Leopold Seda Senghor, he's doing that thinking about the modern artists, because the artist of today doesn't necessarily need to respond to an access of an, a certain ontology you know, that drives uh, their creativity, but feel somehow welded together to a collective uh, unconscious metaphysics, right? And this collective unconscious metaphysics is the one that I want us to unveil today, right? It's not only about what it means to work in that specific context, but how, and, 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 uh, how we work together, how we develop something together, how we nurture a local artisan together. In most of the uh, formulations that we can experience today, and, and I won't talk too much because I, some of the reflections that I brought to, for you today, I will do it in conversation with them. But I thought it was important to, to establish that artists uh, in, in contemporary African cities, artists producing everywhere, but in particular the artists that we have with us now, and, and the artists that you have in this extraordinary, it feels like something very simple, but this is an extraordinary work that Ludovic has been developing for the past two years, in which you could find um, extraordinary initiatives in the continent. One of the things that we will unveil for you is that this is not just a contemporary tendency. From the 50s, theater, street theater initiative, from the 70s, uh, Ngungi Wationgos, uh, Kamiritu Community Education and Cultural Center in, uh, in Kenya, or the work that um, collectives such as Laboratoria Gitar have developed in Dakar, um, proposals like Tank in St. Louis, in Senegal as well, or WIFACET, projects in uh, the Eastern Africa as well. I was thinking now in Jimmy Ogonga, many others that we could have with us, friends and people that have constituted our network now. We could also think in many also South African experiences. Some of these, you have them here, both those that are still operating, but those that also, for whatever reason, perish. And I think I want you to also consider what it means for this extraordinary collective endeavor to um, exist in this particular context. What does it do to the context? How it builds institutions beyond the institutionalized structures that perhaps we recognize in Western terms, right? How we challenge a model that we inherit. And I was saying uh, during lunch how important it was that perhaps now, as much as the modern artists were sort of trying to challenge that sense of Westernness in relation to arts and culture in their communities, they are also challenging the official them. They are sometimes there because there are not enough structures or structures that allow for artistic freedom in the way that they see uh, these, um, these projects going on. I realized that I had the mask on. <laughs> like, it's so weird. We don't have to, how to live without them now. But just to say, just you can see my smile. It's more expressive. Photo? <laughs> no, so the, the, the most extraordinary thing that we can engage with, and, I, and I, I beg you, because some of you I know know these artists for a long time, know their trajectory, you will hear perhaps things that will surprise you now, um, but I want to have a conversation among us on the stage, but also among you. Um, it is important also, I think, to recognize that these are not derivative initiatives, as I was saying earlier. Um, 
but these are people that had tried to nurture their local uh, RSCs, but also, as I was saying, contributed to a social and urban imaginary. Associations that doesn't necessarily last long, and then we can talk about why there is a need uh, for that, um, or for how, what is the role of ephemerality in all of this. But also, the fact that you, most of you, have been more than 10 years in the making and building uh, your, uh, your um, your ecologies, no, your ecosystem. Another thing that is very important for me, uh, perhaps even beyond thinking about what precedes you, is that what you are looking forward to. What are your projects going forward to? But before we get to that discussion that, as Ludovic was saying, will take place after a short break, uh, as soon as we have heard from our guest, uh, we will hear from them uh, in a, about 10 to 15 minutes presentation. There is, of course, a lot to do, and what we hope is that this is an entry point to their practices, that you will be engaged. And, and, and I think, I hope uh, this will happen. Uh, Ludovic was telling me how uh, exciting he will be if this become an actual tool, a database that people can use both um, the, the sort of the organized or these uh, different collective organization institutions. We will also talk about definitions, what it means to, uh, to be an artist collective, what it means to be a residence space, what is, whether it is or not an institution, an organization, etc. So all these things will come up as we go along. Another thing that is important is how much they have uh, interjected with their uh, political uh, and social issues beyond the art world. Right? I really am very interested, and some of you have done brilliantly, to somehow appropriate aspect of the public sphere, right? Uh, whether it's with intervention in the, in the public space or being lobbies for the recognition of the arts at the higher grounds, at the, at the authoritative level. All these things will come out in the conversation, and I hope, as I said before, some of you will participate in the discussion. But without further ado, <laughs> I will um, give the, the turn to our first super extraordinary. I, all of these are my friends. It's so weird <laughs> to be here. The, the, the first weird thing is to be able to hug, you know, which is something very interesting because if there is something that characterizes this, all these organizations, institutions, call it the way you want it, is the fact that they are meant to to gather, right? To gather people together. I remember so beautifully when I was in Addis for the Addis Photo Fest, I had these pictures of tons of people together. Being together means something, experiencing things in real life means something. So I hope you can bring some of that to the conversation. We were gonna have, be speaking in French and in English according to how people feel more comfortable with. And I hope you can do the same from the audience. And if you have any other language, we will try to translate as well. So we Without further ado, please, Sami, can you start the presentation? Thank you. Um, um, hello, hello. Um, hello, hello. I, I, I was told a trick, which is to put your <laughs> the mic against the chick. Is, is the, is how, the, how it works best, if you can see how it works best. So <laughs> this is what you okay. do. <laughs> um, First of all, I would like to say thank you. Enfin, je voudrais dire uh, merci uh, à Ludovic et à all, la thank you to Ludovic and the Foundation uh, for cette, cette organizing uh, this meet and this et, event. Uh, effectivement, comme le dit uh, Just um, Elvira, like uh, Elvira said, c'est une grande joie effectivement de retrouver it's a thrill tous, uh, to see all these people again, all these actors, nous sommes rencontrés dans plusieurs because événements we've et met vraiment before famille, several donc, times. Uh, we are really a family impressionnant and et, uh, it's really it's really impressive and uh, encouraging to be able to um, keep going. Et donc, euh, je sais pas comment ça va se passer, euh, I'm not sure exactly Ludovic, how this works. Ludovic, parle. how does the PowerPoint work? Okay. Uh, 
je suis congolais, je, je viens de, de Lubumbashi, qui est la deuxième ville euh, du, du Congo, euh, la République démocratique du Congo. The Democratic Republic of the, con the, of the Congo, that's the little red dot that you see uh, at the south of the country, and it is the Katanga province. It's a mining region. Assez importante, euh, It's uh, very à la, important. À la fois dans l'histoire du, du pays, mais aussi dans l'histoire mondiale. Uh, for the country uh, and for the et, world. Euh, et c'est là que euh, depuis euh, 2010, uh, avec des amis, un collectif de huit artistes et producteurs, nous avons créé un collectif de huit artistes et producteurs, et nous avons créé un centre pour les arts appelé Picha Art Center. De, uh, Picture the picture comes from en anglais, picture. Et traduit en swahili parce que uh, le swahili était translated into swahili uh, de, uh, because de it is a, a, a crossing Bantu of uh, Arabic, Bantu and English. Image. So this means et, uh, image or picture. Cette structure a commencé this, uh, uh, en 2008. Uh, started in 2008. Après, uh, Enfin, en 2008, où nous avons euh, organisé une We première biennale ensemble avec les membres que vous voyez à côté, y compris le directeur de l'Institut français de Kinshasa, Uh, accompagné, en fait, who uh, really appuyé, supported us uh, pour mettre en place, uh, ce qui va and helped us uh, set up what would Donc, become the Lubumbashi uh, Biennale. Uh, so this was the first uh, 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 iteration in 2008. Uh, it was uh, relatively rapport, rushed. Uh, à une expérience, en fait, um, que it was an experiment. Uh, Donc, uh, Là, c'est une image de, de la ville de, de Lubumbashi, juste pour Lubumbashi, dire que euh, le centre d'art Picha, c'est une ancienne Picha art maison coloniale, to be a colonial house, des cadres which was made for de l'industrie of the mining industry. Ça, c'est le genre de paysage so que une fois que sort of au centre d'art, vous pouvez okay, that you can avoir from the art center. Et, et qui a fait, you see the industrial qui a, qui a ville, side, which really built the city and the province. Du au Katanga, mais euh, the, the que, in Katanga. L'espace, en fait, c'est euh, la ville a été créée en 1910. Euh, autour de, de, de trois pouvoirs principaux, donc uh, l'église, uh, la structure powers, industrielle et l'administration coloniale. Et ce sont ces éléments qui constituent le, le paysage et qui sont encore qui marquent encore en fait, le, le territoire ou, ou uh, la relation en fait qu'on peut avoir avec uh, l'espace public, l'espace public space, the um, urban space. Et évidemment, euh, euh, lors de, de, de la création de la ville, il y avait tout of un principe de segregation based on race, with a, with a limit, with a strict limit between the black people in the south. The city Albert, which was the indigenous. C'est tous les ouvriers en fait qu'on récupérait, les entrepreneurs. Euh, de l'industrie minière uh, uh, recruited vers le sud, c'est-à-dire la Rhodésie qui était euh, uh, la colonie euh, anglaise à l'époque, ou alors le Rwanda qui était allemand, which was et, under et British, même à l'intérieur uh, du pays. Control, et tous ces gens ne répondaient plus or even en, en of the country, sorte and à, 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 à l'organisation euh, euh, ouais, traditionnelle qui était présentée, mais du coup, ils répondre à l'ordre de, euh, de la nouvelle mémoire. Euh, ils étaient entourés de, de, comme vous le voyez, je crois, and à droite, il y a, on the right, tout en haut, la, la partie jaune, il y a un camp yellow, militaire pour, uh, pour camp prévenir de, de, des insurrections qui pouvaient to, venir effectivement uh, du territoire. C'est ce même paysage que nous avons encore aujourd'hui. C'est comme ça se voit aujourd'hui. C'est l'ancienne image. Et, et là, en 2007, on voit très bien que c'est l'ancienne image. Et vous pouvez voir que la limite, la petite ligne jaune, cette petite ligne jaune, la boundary, la dot, le cordon, sanitaire qui This était est ce qu'on appelle le vol d'un moustique et, et was, afin de, 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 de séparer le noir uh, du blanc. Et donc, uh, a sort of a mosquito net to separate the black et, people from white people. Donc, cette zone neutre, elle est so 54, this neutral zone stayed neutral until 54, and uh, now there is, ce, there is life happening in this space. Fragile, uh, it is delicate, Mais, uh, but it's there. Parce que aussi avec le, le I'm telling de, de you this because français, along with the director of the French Institute, we really work to give value to our history and our heritage culture. 
naturally. And so I went into the French Institute to become a, a volunteer photographer to immortalize our heritage. And this is when I got all this information, which came to me violently, because this is not information that you get at school. We don't talk about these things. But all this information about urbanism, the way, how, the way cities are built, how they sprawl, uh, how we establish violence, which the post-colonial power has inherited and which we still deal with, this really inspires my art. Mais aussi, euh, euh, la, la biennale que nous but also inspired the biennial that we started in 2008. And this biennial came from an experience that I had in 2007. I was invited to an event, but even before that, I was at the Biennial of Tras, which is in Belgium, and another one in Paris. And then I was invited to the Bamako Biennale, and this is where for the first time, I met a whole community, African community, from the diaspora or from Africa itself, who were there, who gathered, who talked about um, issues that were dear to my heart. And it was the first time that I met this kind of a public, which fed me, inspired me, and brought me back to this uh, urban or urbanistic history, which I just told you about. And this was for where I met uh, Simon and Jamie for the first time. And I was along with another photographer who also came from the same region uh, as I was. And we had, uh, we, were, we got an award for our work. And after this, I went to see Simon and Jamie and I told him, it's very important that we have this kind of event in our country because it was the first time that I got to see this. So I told him, it's very important for us to have this kind of event too. And he said, well, with this award and knowing that this event is important in Africa, go to the country with your award, meet with the authorities, speak to them and tell them about your award and about the necessity for the same kind of event for us and get their support. So I went back and to this day, we still have not gotten the support of the state or the authorities. But no matter, this is how in 2008, we got our first event with no funding from the state. But the French Institute had given us the, the framework and also helped us with the relationship uh, with the higher-ups of the region. We also had the private benefactors. So we had this first edition. We invited artists that we had met at the Biennale in Bamako. Uh, Calvin Dondo, who came from South Africa, sorry, from Zimbabwe. Everybody was there. All the artists were invited. Okay. Barry Bickle and so on, Mauro Pinto. And with Simon, the, the idea was to exchange, because he came in in 2010, and we wanted to give him all the information that we had gathered through our work on the history of urbanism, uh, segregation, uh, health control, security control, uh, ethnic questions which had set the landscape. And we spoke with Simon, but keeping in mind that uh, Lubumbashi only has one ethnographic museum, which also has a archaeologic and ethnographic uh, department. It's the only museum. And they have decent spaces for exhibitions, but uh, there is also the Fine Arts Institute, which also serves as a so the people graduating are not real artists yet, so to speak. They're learning the technique. And this technique goes back to Romain de Fossé, which is a whole other story. Anyway, there was no exhibition space. So we started to speak with Simon. Oh, two more minutes? Okay. Ooh. Okay. Sorry. 
Et à partir de là, nous avons décidé And, uh, going from there with Simon, we decided to do a biennial that's outside of the walls. Et We're going to go to the public. So that's how we started to uh, show these um, billboards outside. <laughs> And Zineb is uh, in front of the museum, uh, this uh, Lubumbashi museum I spoke about. And we also did a, a, an outdoors projection. We also did the second edition with Elvira here, who reacted to our commitment to the space with Simon. If we don't have space for the public, let's go to the public. We're going to create this excitement uh, with the public. And so we went to the schools, and this is how the project was born. This project of working on the, the engagement of the children and the young people working with young artists to uh, local artists to give them access to what happens internationally, all the while staying rooted in the local realities. So there's a training programs and they bear fruit and we present them at the biennials and uh, there are local artists. We also have another space 40 kilometers away from uh, Abambashi where women talk, uh, work from their murals, which is a tradition. And starting from these murals, we try to uh, start a a textile project uh, uh, to decenter de 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 this practice in the south. Our city is much closer uh, to Zambia uh, et, et Kinshasa est à 2000 km, and Kinshasa uh, is 2,000 kilometers uh, away. De so in a ça, way we decentralize this by uh, creating a, a bond. Uh, Especially since the pre-colonial empires engulf all these uh, all these territories <laughs> and the Sorry, borders I are artificial. We will continue the conversation. I think it's very important some aspect that you started to unveil around issues about appropriation of history in a way, you know, like not only by capturing history with your with the photography and with the activities, but also by helping nurture and training an, a new generation of individuals that will now uh, ha wouldn't have that, let's say, uh, violence encounter with the, with the history, as you mentioned. No? And I feel like that's uh, one of the key components of some of the things that you do. I'm very glad that the workshops are keeping, um, um, uh, you know, keeping, giving pace to also, um, let's say, living together with exhibition. No? I think that's important. And also in the case of um, Aida Moulounet, which is the next uh, presenter, I think you had to pass, maybe we had oh. to pass this. Um, the worship has also been key, you know, and, and, and the, uh, perhaps you can talk about both uh, uh, Desta and the pedagogies, uh, sort of the, 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 the structure that you have set up for um, bringing a, an understanding of ownership of, of the visual production. I think that's also very important in your case. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Elvira. Um, I just want to say thank you to the uh, Louis Vuitton Foundation and especially Ludwig. Um, this is uh, a family reunion for us because uh, we've known each other, a few of us, we've known each other since the beginning of our careers. Um, and it's been really uh, an interesting journey. So my name is Aida Mulune. Um, I'm from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I grew up in different parts of the world. Uh, but I finished my high school education in Canada and my uh, university at Howard University in Washington, D.C. I started out as a photojournalist. Uh, most people only know me as a fine art photographer, but actually the foundation of my work is in journalism. Um, and in the beginning of my photographic career, my main focus has been on the misrepresentation of my country, Ethiopia. Most people uh, imagine that Ethiopia is, you know, uh, you know, the image of famine of the 80s, you know, there's specific images that have stuck in the conscience of especially the international audience. So for a majority of my career as a photojournalist, what I was looking at was the misrepresentation of not just only Ethiopians in the international photo market, but also the misrepresentation of people of color in the West. 
And it was one of those things where I spent a lot of time um, really addressing that from a very early age. I worked at the Washington Post, you know, I've, I've done several publications. Um, and it wasn't really until I arrived in the Bamako Biennale where I met Simone Jami. And really, um, and I think all of us can, can attest to, uh, to this, is Bamako for us is a very uh, special place. It's a place that I think in a sense uh, birthed all of us to enter into uh, a specific thinking of understanding that we're not alone in this struggle of trying to sort of uh, li living outside of the continent and fighting the fight in a, in a way. So I remember, I don't think Simone remembers this, but uh, before I even met him, um, I had sent this idea that I had about having a photo festival of uh, photographers from Africa. And when I arrived in Bamako, I realized really the urgency of having more of these kind of events in the continent. So when I started the Addis Photo Fest in 2010, prior to that, I arrived in my country after, I don't know, 20 years of absence. And I was only supposed to be there for three months. And three months became 13 years. And the thing that I realized was that, um, you know, as Africans, we can sit here and complain about realities and we can say this is not working and that's not working. But I've always been a believer of discussing solutions because we already know the realities of the, the problems. And I think when Sammy was talking about the support from the, uh, the government, I never had romantic ideas that our government would ever support our activities. The only thing that we ever expected uh, from the government was just a letter of support. That's all, we never asked for money, we never asked for funding. And the thing you have to understand in Ethiopia is that we have heavy censorship. Um, I've run 10 years of this festival, really with a, a freedom of being be able to do what I want to do, because I felt that it was quite important to engage the government uh, to sort of let them know we're doing this activity, come to this activity. And in a sense, you know, I think over the years I became probably the most annoying person to the Ethiopian government because I was always in their office arguing about specific things. So in that sense, uh, when I first came to, to Addis Ababa, I wanted to start teaching photography so um, because I realized there was a lot of things in photography that didn't exist within the institutions. Um, so I started teaching in the fine arts school, but over time I realized it wasn't just about teaching new image makers, but it was also how do I teach my own community of what is photography? Um, how do I teach the government to understand the power of image besides you know, propaganda, besides commercial applications? And so in 2010, I started the Addis Photo Fest, and it was really, um, an interesting experience to say the least. Um, I start off by saying I'm not a curator, I'm not an art critic, I'm not an art historian, I'm just a lover of other people's works. And through that, I want to show that to my own people. And I remember when I first started the Addis Photo Fest, because we normally have it in December, there was you know, an expat who said, you know, why are you doing it in December? You know, none of the expats will be here. Everybody goes for vacation. And I said, really, my focus is not the foreigners. My focus is my own people because I'm trying to develop new talent and this has been my ultimate goal. So from the inception, uh, the Addis Photo Fest was not just about uh, exhibitions. It was also about having uh, discourse, having conversations to really understand um, what is photography? And I'm a believer that, um, and I, I just want to be clear, I'm not running just an African photo festival, I'm running an international photo festival because I do believe that we're in a global reality in which the challenges of all photographers are uh, the same in some instances, but at the same time, we need to have conversations with photographers globally. And through that, uh, what I have noticed is that we became sort of a unique event in which it's sort of rare to have a photographer from Uruguay meeting a photographer from Nigeria or a photographer from the Middle East, you know. And I've always maintained sort of this global outlook because I am a product of sort of migration. 
But through that, I realized that we need to build connecting points because at the end, it is through these conversations that we're able to also find solutions to the basic problems that we have within the context of uh, our cultural events. And throughout the years, um, you know, we started building in, for example, we had uh, a portfolio review. And this really became one of the pinnacle points of our event uh, because we were reviewing photographers from the continent with international engagement. And in that selection, what we started seeing is that, you know, a lot of the opportunities for photographers on the continent is just a matter of connecting points. So, for example, in our 2018 uh, festival, it was really the first time that National Geographic came to Addis Ababa, even though they had supported us in the previous edition. But just by them physically coming to Ethiopia and meeting all these photographers, uh, majority of them that were reviewed ended up getting inside the Nat Geo uh, system of receiving grants, uh, you know, becoming explorers. So a lot of the editors that I've seen in the international uh, media is that they just don't know where everybody is. And in my teaching and what I try to uh, develop is really that education is such a fundamental base. Um, a lot of the challenges that we have in the continent is the lack of institutions. And I don't mean structures. I'm talking about institutions that help us compete in the international market. I think across most of our countries, we do have art schools, but what is being taught in these art schools is not at a level that helps us to compete. So a majority of the artists that come out of the continent is not because they went to school, it's because of their persistence and their dedication to their craft, because that was the most relevant thing of having to say something, not just to our own people, but also to the international world. And through that, we've built different projects, such as at work through the Moleskin Foundation. Um, eventually, we started building in an award. So for me, um, I'm not really a fan of awards, but the one thing that I've realized is that all the photographers that we reviewed, um, which you know they spent three days uh, with several experts, through that we decided, okay, we need to award three photographers to give them support to the next phase of their, uh, their career. And this means that we're giving award not based on just the work or who who they know or what their CV is, but it was really based on that one-on-one -on -one conversation that we felt, okay, this person has a potential to go to the, to the next steps. And through this journey, you know, it's really been, um, it's been very challenging. Um, there's a lot of, um, how many minutes I have? No, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, through this journey, it's been uh, quite rewarding in the sense that I've learned a lot and also, the key thing that I have seen is the impact that we've had on the ground. Uh, because when I first started, for example, there was really no such thing as street photography. So by us doing workshops on the streets in order to get our community to understand what photography is besides just the police arresting us, this started having sort of a long-term implication to the point now what there is a lot of uh, photographers from Ethiopia that are inside the international market and who are able to document our own realities. And that was really my ultimate uh, goal. And the key thing that I always say is that it's very easy for me to hang my work in museums on our white walls, but the most difficult is to change the market and to change the perception of what is photography uh, within the context of Ethiopia. And overall now we've started touring the festival uh, to different parts of the world because I realized that we need to also embed ourselves in the global conversation. So it wasn't just about ta you know, taking Africa, I mean, bringing different people into Africa, but also how do we take Africa into the global market? Is that enough? That's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. I mean, they, thank you. There will be more time to, to discuss specific issues that you have raised, the idea of persistence, right? The lack of art school or the art institution that allow for the kind of uh, practice that you are aiming to, to build. But I want to talk about that a little bit more with uh, Moathat because the, the, one will have the perception that Cairo has such a structures, that it has been um, a proposition, right, uh, from the, 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 for many years of different, uh, also, let's say, non-governmental. I think you had to do the thing that I mentioned and it will work. They will make it work. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but yes, please go ahead. And, and thank you. Uh, thank you first for uh, 
for this beautiful gathering, and uh, I'm happy to be with my friends. And uh, it was so emotional for me actually to see them after all this time. And uh, yeah, it's my first travel since the whole thing started, so uh, I'm happy to be here one way or another. So, uh, uh, DARP started as an idea uh, a long time ago in 2004 when I were in Dakar and I was uh, thinking of uh, how come the government is only in control of all the art scene in Egypt. It was the only source, the only way to, to show your work. And I, at that time, I was already having some issues, let's say, uh, showing with the government. I mean, uh, um, um, maybe my work is a little bit, uh, as an artist, is a little bit political, social. So it was not really very much accepted. And uh, there was a kind of trial to, to put me on a side. So uh, uh, I decided to keep on going and to, to start a place where, um, uh, where, I can, where artists can be able to express themselves and show all, everything they, uh, they want to say. Um, in 2008, we started uh, in an area, a very unique area, to be honest. It was uh, slums. But uh, we turned it to something different, as you can see in the photos. And uh, the thing is, when we started, the, the, it was closed by the government right away. Because at that time, um, according to, to the guy who was responsible, uh, he said that uh, this is uh, governmental things. I mean, how come one person? Uh, who are you to do something like that? But anyway, we managed to open again after a year of closing. And in the opening, it was amazing because all, a lot of my friends from all over the world, artists, they came and they paid themselves because actually I, we put all, our, all the money in this project. We were almost broke to, totally. So I, I had something like 14 or 15 artists from all over the world. They paid the tickets and they brought their work and, or they did it in Egypt. And it was an amazing show, one of the kind. And it was at the same time at the Cairo Ben Ali. And that was a very good start. And from there we continue going on. Uh, it was not an easy uh, 14 years, um, but uh, there was a lot of things happened throughout this. Uh, oh, I should uh, keep moving this. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, the, you know, of course, you heard of, there was a revolution, <laughs> a kind of, in 2011, <laughs> January. And uh, there was a Cairo Bin Ali and Alexandria Bin Ali, which was the biggest uh, cultural events at that time. They stopped it since uh, 2010, the last, the last time. So, uh, well, we tried to convince the government, how come you, you should do it? But it's all, always it's impossible. It's for security reasons, for money-wise, all, all these things. So again, and again, and I think all of us will keep saying again, Simon Jami. <laughs> Simon Jami and uh, our our good friend, our good follow. He uh, uh, with him, we uh, I said we want to do something. Said okay, I'm with you. Let's start something, and we called it something else. And it was like an off for a binali. We invited almost 120 artists from all over the world. Uh, the first edition was 2015. And it was fantastic. We occupied Darb and we occupied a lot of places around the city. It was fantastic and it was amazingly received and it was an incredible buzz. Uh, we tried to do it again, but of course it's very hard and very difficult because it's a huge coast. And, uh, I, but I have to say also that most of the artists and the curators who, who attended, who take, took part in this, they came, they managed to get their own money and they, the artists themselves, they managed to do that. So it was, again, a kind of collaborative, uh, loving uh, 
work altogether. Even the curator, Simon himself, I mean, he, uh, I mean, we were eating together. That's, that's what I can offer. So anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so again, in, uh, we, we, we do it again in 2018. And it was, again, very successful. And we invited 120 artists also from around the world. And it, 115, I guess. And it was fantastic with a lot of curators. And at that point, only at that point, the government decided to do the Cairo Benali again in 2018, right? In 18 as well, right after we did the hours, which was something uh, very good because um, we were happy that again things start to move and uh, there was something happening, and we were kind of uh, uh, inspiring for them to let's keep going and go on. Um, you know, the uh, we are not we are almost like any other. African country. We, we don't have critics, we don't have art magazines. We, uh, the education at the university stopped at uh, Picasso. Uh, so uh, there's not, not much. So the, everything you have to do, you have to do yourself. I mean, you have to depend on yourself. You have to create anything yourself. You have to educate yourself. So we were trying all the time to do a lot uh, throughout the years, to do a lot of uh, educational things like uh, workshops, bring uh, whatever artists coming from around the world, that the, they have to, to, to meet the other artists and talk to them about their experiences and ch uh, exchange and encourage them. We were also invited to, uh, to uh, several uh, spots, like we were in the Dakar Binali, uh, Azdarb, uh, to represent 20 artists there. We were. Egyptian artist, and also in Bamako, and in Indonesia, and in Denmark, and we took artists, Egyptian artists, to go there because we wanted to, them to see that there is a different language than the language that, the, that we are speaking there, and the, uh, this language, the whole world is speaking it, and we need to, to be on the same level in order to be understood. So. Uh, um, uh, uh, I have to go, go back to, to, to where is Darb. Darb is in the, it's in a very, uh, very, very special area. It's in the middle of uh, where the first synagogue and the first church and the first mosque was built. It's in this area. It's a very unique area. And it was totally uh, for, for, uh, forgotten to the extent it becomes a, become a slums. So now, just a couple of months ago, they start to renew the whole area, and they removed everything around us. Although the government doesn't like us very much, but they decided to keep the space. Uh, uh, but at the same time, um, they refused to renew our license to work. So since 2018, we're working without license. Uh, but we're working. I mean, so anyway, uh, it means uh, to keep us this way is like, uh, be careful, don't exceed the, the red lines, otherwise. So if you hear that something happened to Darby, it's because we don't have license to work. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's more or less. What I, I was about to say that you had two minutes, but okay. um, that's, you, that's you had. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can just show the rest of the photos. Yeah, go ahead and, and tell us. Yeah, yeah. About so we have a lot of activities and we have a lot of community activities around. I mean, we worked a lot with. At the beginning, when we opened, uh, they were calling Darp, the neighborhood was calling us the, the uh, whole house because there was a lot of parties, a lot of uh, ladies coming and going. <laughs> but now they, they become part of the activities and they come, and a lot of them, a lot of kids are working with us and they like the activities that we're doing. And of course, we're not only, we started as contemporary art space, but we are working with whatever is contemporary, we work with underground music. Uh, we work with, uh, we, do, we have a cinema now, we show uh, experimental movies, we, uh, we do a lot of workshops for kids and for adults in different, different things, and, uh, and we also, and I have to say that we are 
100% depending on volunteers. And as you see this picture that uh, have most of the volunteers that works, worked with us throughout the years. Ah, okay, so now it's you. It's uh, Zenith. Ah. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Moha, because you have also highlighted another issue that we were like, what makes possible a structure, right? And uh, like, what is necessary? Finance, license, you know, like there is a dialogue that you established with the government, as Ida was uh, mentioning. But I think it will be important to to un to try to understand how one develops something that is self-initiated and self-sustained, and what is you know, the uh, as um, either beautifully put it, no, the, 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 the no romantic expectations of having support of the government, like where that leads you and, and what that made the space to become, no? which I think is something important to go back to at some point. Um, Sinead, please. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Ludovic and Elvira and everyone here at the Fondation Louis Vuitton. I'm going to speak in English. I know it's strange because I'm French and French is my mother tongue, but purely because I lived in England for a long time and I started this project from England, um, and it's easier sometimes for me. Um, so yes, I started a project, uh, Artist Residence in Algiers in 2010, 11, if I remember well, and it started because I had an access of a flat um, in Algiers in 2005, I think. Um, beautiful flat in the center of, uh, of Algiers. And uh, I was only using it when I was going to uh, Algeria, and the rest of the time it was pretty much empty. But also as an artist who travels and exhibits a bit everywhere, I was meeting a lot of artists who were very, very curious about Algeria, but scared of coming. Obviously, uh, 2005, six, seven, it just, you know, a few years after the, what we call the Black Decades, that kind of more or less finished in 2001, 2002. So Algeria still had, um, had this image of being a, a, an Islamist uh, uh, and super dangerous country. Um, and I wanted to break this, uh, this image. I really wanted to break this image because I was going to Algeria all the time with a lot of friends, Algerian or non-Algerian, and there was no problem whatsoever. Of course, another difficulty with Algeria, it's probably the only country in the Maghreb region where you need a visa. So a lot of people have put up, you know, put off by this idea of having to apply. We're so used to travel everywhere with no visa, so when a country has a visa, it becomes an issue. Um, but I did manage to get everyone to come in Algeria and apply for visa and everyone got them, so there was no problem. Anyways, it, there was this kind of curiosity and demands. A lot of artists wanted to make work about Algeria, but thought they couldn't go because it was too dangerous. Others were purely curious. Um, so I decided informally, initially, to invite them in my flat in Algiers, curators, artists, a lot of actually Algerians from the diaspora, um, you know, were worried or, you know, or didn't know anyone in Algiers or, you know, because they were coming from cities uh, outside of Algiers. Uh, so it started informally. And then in 2010, 11, I started thinking, oh, perhaps I should try to do something a bit more official. Uh, of course, a big issue for all of us here, uh, it's uh, money, the funding, and uh, I managed to apply. I, I must say, I must admit, and it's quite uh, embarrassing to do so, but uh, the only funding bodies that would support my project were um, funding bodies in Europe. Um, nobody locally in Algeria or in Africa uh, will support the project. Uh, no private uh, mécène or, you know, or public one. So uh, I did manage to get a bit of money and I decided to invite. So it started as a proper residency where we'll invite few artists a year to come and stay in the flat. We will pay for everything and it always will be a research stroke production uh, residency, but we never had enough money to really um, give the artists to produce a big piece of work, but they could at least do some research. It started also by me inviting artists that I felt would have um, uh, will benefit from the from Algeria, political or any other way. So the, the artists I was inviting were very targeted. Sometimes they were at contacting me and asking me if they could go because they had a project. And um, so that's the way it started. Um, 
they came and they stayed, and we will always, always put them in touch with local people, depending on the research, because they were always coming for some research initially, and they would tell me in advance who they wanted to meet, what they wanted to do, where they wanted to go, if there was some visit they wanted to do in Algiers or outside of Algiers, and we will actually cater for that. So I will come from London, or Yasmina Regad, who is a project curator, will come from London, and we will stay with them at least for the first week in order to... Um, uh, to, 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 to host them and, and show them a bit the, the country. But then locally, there was always uh, somebody uh, in Algiers that would take care of them while they were staying there. So the residency only lasted a month. Sometimes they could stay longer if they wanted to, but we will pay only for a month. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the way the kind of the whole residency started. And of course, there were artists, but there were creators and academics sometimes that came. Uh, we've got, I've got on my PDF a list of some artists that came. Um, and yeah, what's very important to say is that every artist invited and coming to Algiers had to give something in exchange and, 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 or participate with the locals. So he either give a talk at l'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, for example, Alfredo Jarre came, gave a talk at uh, l'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, uh, Mohamed Bouissa did uh, actually an informal, more like portfolio reading with some artists. Um, so depending on the artists who was coming to Algeria, uh, I wasn't imposing anything to them. We were finding a way that both the locals and the artists invited will actually find a way to communicate with the local audience. So as I said, through portfolio reading, sometimes it's very informal, as informal perhaps of going to a restaurant and having a big meal with few artists and discussing the practice. Um, so it was very organic in the way it was set up. There was no kind of a rigid structure, uh, even in terms of the amount of time people wanted to stay. Then we decided also to invite some artists because in, in Algeria, the art scene is very focused in the capital. And Atef Berejet here is from um, Anaba, which is east uh, on the border with Tunisia, could never benefit of what was going on in, in Algiers. So we decided also sometime to invite local artists outside of Algiers to come and benefit from being in, uh, in Algiers. Um, Kapwani Kiwanga, she came, she did also a, a talk at uh, L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Then we had Younes Rahmoun also that came, and we did a talk in an in a, uh, art school called, uh, I can't remember the name just now, uh, Artissimo, yeah. Uh, but that, what was really interesting with um, Younes Rahmoun, uh, it was in response, a lot of the Algerian artists were really questioning the fact that they were artists and they were Muslim and they were often believers and even practicing Muslim. And some of them were struggling in terms of their religious religion and, and making art, ma making contemporary art. So in response to this question, which I, <laughs> I couldn't really respond to myself because I'm not really religious, I invited Younes Rahmoun because I thought he would be the perfect person to actually talk about his own you know, uh, religious practice and his art practice. And he came in, it was a really, really wonderful, I must say, really powerful uh, meeting with, uh, with the Algerian artists. Um, so we did, and so suddenly things changed, you know, initially it started as a, as a residency and suddenly we started being invited, uh, you know, by other residency outside of, uh, like Delf Delfina, for example, or, or other residency, uh, residencies in Europe, we were asked to work with them and invite and, and, and send some Algerian local artists there. So that was another thing. And then there was also some commissions. Here you see again Atef with Nora Razian, who was at the time curator at the Tate Modern. She's now in Dubai. She's a curator, senior curator at the Jamil um, Foundation. Uh, and here you see them uh, having conversation about uh, Atef's work. So we were inviting also sometimes curators to discuss and share and meet local artists. Um, we did also the first 154 art fair, which is an African art fair in London. We were invited by Turia to, um, and we were given a free space to actually produce a piece of work and show a piece of work. And we invited the, 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 art, the Algerian artist Amina Menia, and we actually commissioned her. We got money from the Art Council of England 
for her to produce a piece of work that was really exciting also. So the project kind of started moving into different type of direction, but very naturally and very organically. And more and more people were contacting us for different things. And when we could, or when we thought it was interesting, we would, um, we would cater to the demand. But also, to be honest, it's also because we had a problem of fundings. So when, for example, we have Delphina who invites you to residency and they say they're paying for everything, so, of course, we were trying to make contacts and partnership with those, um, those residency uh, programs that I thought were really interesting. Um, and then we did some exhibition, like, for example, at the Mosaic Room uh, in London. Uh, we created a show with Algerian artists from the diaspora and local ones. Um, then some workshops also, you know, um, when it was possible, Jamel Tata was, in, uh, was having a big solo show at the MAM at the Museum of Modern Art and Contemporary Art in Algiers. And I asked him, of course I was using my own contact, I asked him if he would kindly meet some of the artists. And here you see uh, Jamel, Tata, uh, Jamel Tata with some of the artists in the flat. Um, so I was also taking the opportunity when some people were there, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, we're going to man mention again si Simon's name. Uh, Simon came uh, in Algiers and we, I think we had dinner at my flat and, you know, so I would try always when people were in the area in Algeria. And I must say at the time in Algeria, the state was making a lot of exhibition and I think Simon came for the FIAC, Festival International d'Art Contemporain. So there was a kind of buzz that lasted four or five years and so a lot of international artists. I remember Mona Hatoum being there, a lot, a lot of uh, international artists, and I will use this opportunity to make them meet, or, you know, officially or unofficially um, uh, local artists. Uh, yeah. Here we, have, we had a sound workshop with Hanan, with, uh, yeah, Hanan. Uh, that was really interesting also, um, with artists who are interested in sounds, sound in Algiers. And then, yeah, various projects. That was a residency outside of Algeria. So we had a, a project, a partner with uh, Villa Romana, uh, Trancat Tetouan, uh, Art School Palestine, Marie Beauvau came also in Algiers and did some photos, Jason Odi. Some projects actually ended up, uh, some artists ended up making also artwork. And then you could see the artwork exhibited uh, all over the world. And others, uh, it just stayed at a level of research, but hopefully they, it was uh, uh, interesting for whoever came. And that's, uh, I think, the latest list. Um, and, and at the moment, we're talking about, uh, we're speaking, uh, we're doing a partnership with Villarson, because Maya ben will be going and doing a residency there with, in partnership with Aria and, and Villarson. Um, so a lot of different things, not just traditional uh, residency, uh, um, and that's it. And really the idea it was for me to bring artists to, to, to uh, Algiers because the artists from Algiers couldn't go abroad because of the visa situation that a lot of us know about. And then I thought if they can't travel, then let's bring them. Uh, artists, creators, art critics, academics, and that's the way uh, that the way Aria was born, really. Thank you so much, uh, Sinead. This this uh, also connect with some of the um, the attends that uh, Aida and um, Sami, but also Mota has talked about uh, trying to to go from uh, the specific localities that they inhabit towards out no? and like what it takes to sustain that global conversation and who is allowed, who is um, making available a space, a platform to do that no? and what it means to reappropriate the aims and the tools that made that possible, whether that is through these sort of like uh, alliances that take you um, to all these other projects, but also but that, but that what it means, no? as, as Mosa was saying, um, to bring people with you. It's not only, it's a structure that allows you, a platform that allows you to bring others with you, no? which I think is important. These gestures that you do to make um, a, a platform, uh, to widen it, no? the possibilities of the platform. And I was thinking also about this idea of uh, giving something back and collaborating with peers, not recognizing peers, international peers, uh, somewhere along uh, the, 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 the other side of the, of the 
of, of, the, of the channels. No? So I feel that that's also a critical um, issue in some of your pro projects that I think we need to somehow uh, bring back. Um, uh, I keep the, this idea of the exchange and the and the uh, and the and also not not only that, but the attempt to merge with. Est uh, establish institutions locally as well, no? like the, to renew their discourses, to somehow take them with you to bring them forward to the 20th century, right? The 21st century. So I think, I, I think those are critical issues as well. Thank you. Um, we're going to hear now from Barthélemy. There you go. Go ahead. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Hello. Merci, Thank you, Elvira. And uh, thank you, especially to the Fondation Louis Vuitton for the symposium, uh, for this talk. I'm very moved to talk about this project, which began when I finished my studies at the Fine Arts School in Abidjan. And I was leaving for France, where I spent four years at the art school in Grenoble, and then two years at the Academy of Dusseldorf. So I spent a total of 10 years, four years in uh, Abidjan, four in Grenoble, and two in uh, Dusseldorf. And I thought, you have to think, what are you giving to Africa? What are you giving to this idea, to this notion that this intellectual idea, for example, the Jewish community thought, what are we giving to our community? What are we giving back to Africa? What are we giving to our brothers? when we have gained skills? So in the 2000s, I went back to Cameroon on a familiar uh, land, uh, 300 kilometers away from Douala, and uh, I started building my project because I realized over these 10 years that the African, the classic African art was pillaged because the colonizers took everything without permission. They loaded things on the boats and went back to the West with our things. And the, the the way that uh, contemporary art was going, I thought these are two losses for Africa. The classical art is gone and comp contemporary art is unknown to the local authorities and it's not going anywhere. At the time I was at Anne de Villepois and then Le Long Galleries and I thought, who is buying my art? No Africans were. So I thought this is a double loss for Africa. And I immediately thought we have to build something physically on the continent, not only to conserve this um, production of contemporary art, but also build a place where African artists can, can make their projects happen. So I started on empty land. And, and I started to build my project from the basement up all the way up to the roof. And we are um, having our big opening ceremony. And we have a lot of young people who came to celebrate art. And this here is a meeting at Bonjour Station around a table. And the most important thing there is talking, organizing moments for, for dialogue, to get to know each other, and to have ideas to work together. A meeting and helping each other is very important at Bandrun Station. And everybody who came to Bandrun Station will always remember this huge table where we had our talks. And I remember that here in 2002, 
When Kendi Willy called me, and he wanted to come to Africa and wanted, he wanted me to go with him to the Congo. And when we were in Cameroon, we went to Brazzaville, and then we went back to Banjul, where he did this series of, of portraits in Benjun Station. And it is part of the collection because it's one of the only places in Africa where there is a permanent collection. De, d'avoir réalisé que so, uh, la classique ne se trouvait uh, plus sur le continent. The problem was realizing that the classical art was gone from the continent and that contemporary art was leaving us and going abroad too. This was a very important to us, having this permanent collection where you see uh, this, Tanzan- this artist from Tanzania as well as David Ockney. David Lynch aussi, and David qui a donné Lynch as well, who gave over three, uh, over 30 uh, etchings to Benjamin Station. Around Bouli Boisbré was not very far from Louis Bourgeois. Uh, everybody mingles together. All the pieces are meshed together, and that is the strength of Benjamin Station. And uh, to go back to what Jean Robert Martin was saying with the people of the earth, which uh, puts the uh, contemporary artists of Benin and Germany side by side to talk about contemporary art uh, itself in its purest form. When I was invited to the uh, exhibition called Africa Remix, thank you, Simon, I really realized how much this wealth of contemporary art from Africa, how big it was, and really, it really so solidified my project to keep building Bandur Station. It took three years, uh, just, uh, just the physical construction. And uh, over there, the focus is on the youth that comes to see the exhibitions that we're having. Uh, When I was a kid, I didn't get to go to museums when I was in middle school or in primary school. So here we have artists who come and have performances and uh, just perform on stage. And as you can see here, little school children uh, who are lucky enough to come and uh, participate to our uh, to our workshops. And we also did projects with women, as you can see on the right. It's right in front of Bandung Station. And this was uh, set up by Alicia Knock uh, from Centre Georges Pompidou, the Woman Power exhibition. It's also a place where we have to delete or get rid of the certain discriminations that some, some people and some communities have to live with in our society. And uh, later on, the second side of Bandung Station was a farming project, as you can see. Beans, corn are grown, most importantly, to feed people quality food to the the population. There's also a quote from Sangor, which really made an impact on me, which was the market price of produce and commodities is very low, and we decided to grow our own coffee, which you can see here. We grew it ourselves. We planted it in 2010, and the first harvest was in 2014, and we decided to make a completely green packaging with uh, limited edition packaging depending on the artist. And the first time we uh, presented this was by uh, a work from Toya Leglaoui. So I want this coffee to exist now. We set the price. It's not like uh, other coffee uh, where African coffee uh, has pr- has its prices set by the West. No, we set the price. It's 20 euro. It's like a little work of art. It's not expensive, but we set the price. <laughs> so this is... Uh, <laughs> and I will end by talking uh, on the, about the Bantu Station edition and this uh, these are all the events we've had at the bedroom station. 
We want to really uh, to edit this and keep a trace of this. Because I looked at Cape Town, uh, in Casablanca, everywhere. I think we're the only ones in Africa. The very few places, anyway, keep a memory of these uh, editions of their project. This is all funded by my credit card to this day. Voilà, ça c'est la dernière photo. So there you go. This is the last photo. I'm serving coffee. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bartolomé, for that. We will we will take your word on that. I think you you mentioned something very critical now, which is the context with the environment. How can we help to build something else? I remember. Uh, talking with uh, Otto von Nkanga not so long ago with the project that she's doing between uh, Lagos, um, her residence in um, Atwer and, and Athens. No? And the possibility of creating love, thinking and economical and financial uh, forms of development, right? All of these things that made uh, initiative go beyond the art world. I think this is key in, in sort of some, everything that you have said, not only because of the dialogue that you established with the official done, with the politics, with the artists in the scene. It's also with the real life, with presentness, with all of those components that made life in Cairo, Addis Abeba, or, or Algiers, uh, Lubumbashi possible. No? And, and with that, I want to go to our uh, next and last uh, speaker and of this part of the of the session, Dana, um, whose work I, I was saying to you how how much I admire and have accompanied me in those discussions that we can find online. But I look forward for you to explain more and and then take it that as a as a, the way forward to our conversation. Please go ahead. Thank you, um, thank you Elvira and Ludovic and the Foundation Louis Vuitton for bringing us together. Um, I'm Dana Wabira, I'm an artist, I'm trained as an architect, and I run a space called Injilele Art Station in Harare. Um, it's an independent project space, and the main focus of the station is the generation of projects through research, experimentation, and exchange. Um, it is there to generate a critical gaze on society and history, and it's interested in notions of interconnection, community, and conviviality. In the past, programs have encompassed a residency, exhibition, talks, including a collaboration with the National Gallery of Zimbabwe, and now radio. Um, Injilele started in 2013, really as a pop-up exhibition for the photographer Calvin Dondo. And uh, we realized that there was space for a platform that would bring artists and ideas together. Um, among the projects that we've been putting together um, is a collaboration with Kwanza Month of, Month of Photography, which was founded by Dondo. Um, it took place in 2014, and um, uh, it was titled the Moonwalking Exhibition. And it took place in over 20 unconventional um, venues across the city center. Um, it was inspired by a visit by Michael Jackson in 1998 <laughs> to Harare. And we've been working on a research-based project on the regional railway that weaves together a history of music, migration, and agency. It looks at how people, resources, culture, freedom, and revolution moved along and across the lines in the Sadak region. It was first shown in Munich in 2018 under the title Cartographic Entanglements as a composition of uh, wall mural, text and sound. And um, it was a collaboration between the artist Nolan Oswald Dennis, um, the historian and curator Temin Kosigoniwe, um, and myself. Um, the project developed to become 
uh, movement and gathering sound working diagram, um, which was shown in Kinshasa and produced in collaboration with the performance artist, artist Florian Sinanduku. And in 2019, um, it uh, was shown in Mombasa and here included a reading with Mose Chikowero um, from his book, Africa, I'm um, sorry, African Music, Power and Being in Colonial Zimbabwe. Uh, this year, um, the art station uh, began broadcasting as a radio station and it seemed a natural progression as the thread of sound interconnection and networks um, and community uh, weaves through our projects. Um, and when we were looking at uh, radio formats, we were um, struck by the idea of, of freeform radio, how it gives um, a breadth for an experimental, interdisciplinary, and a generative platform. Um, one that enhances the notion of democracy. Um, and programming draws from the complex history of radio in our political and social movements and how these can um, address our current struggles. Um, it's also timely because it was during lockdown and we were uh, questioning, I guess, how we can connect and, and be together and communal radio offered um, this possibility. So we be began with uh, two pr programs. One was Mujejeje, uh, which uh, means, the meaning is uh, stones, and it's a form of ancient sound technology. So when they are struck, um, they issue a sound that resonates across long distances and carries an important range of information. And um, uh, this was um, important in, in, in thinking about how they formed a sophisticated broadcast communication networks and how we could reload this metaphorically. And so we began a process of mapping. Can I go back one? Um, last year, I'm sorry. In, in, in 2019, and we approached our fellow practitioners, you can see listed here, and it was based on thinking around space at the intersection of memory, resilience, and geography, and really produced a reading of, of, of cities, and these were displayed as uh, sound stations in, in Mombasa. Uh, this year, uh, the project, oops, that's it. Sorry, this year Mujejeje um, invited uh, contributors to be in conversation. And um, so it was for the radio program and they explore transnational sonic histories and um, shared uh, music imaginaries, sorry, and um, uh, across Africa and its diaspora. And we have six programs which are compositions of different inspiration in both text and audio, or both. Um, it's a modest start of six. Uh, we hope to see maybe a hundred, <laughs> hundreds of mujeridis, you know, spread around the world in the future. Um, the project draws much from the Zimbabwean poet and academic uh, Tsitsi Jaji. And I just want to have read out a small quote from her book, African Stereo, Modernism, Music, and Pan-African Solidarity. Occasionally things shift into place, and for a moment stones sing. In that moment we come together in the name of ancestors held dear, artists and thinkers with whom we may share no genetic links, but whose work connects us to the heritage of human solidarity. And this is our uh, second program. It's called Concepts of Love. It's a podcast. Um, it's hosted by the Angolan uh, curator and writer, Susanna Sosa. 
Um, the series is born out of conversations uh, between friends that extended to artists and intellectuals from across the continent. Um, it's an open-ended inquisition on love in our contemporary world, its experiences both in life and in art. And it was um, inspired by um, B.C. Silver, her seminal show, um, Progress of Love, and is dedicated in loving memory to her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you also for bringing love to the conversation. We started the afternoon saying how much we cherish this moment because all your propositions, all your projects have that deep love for ourselves as community, for our craft as professionals. And, and I think it's so important also to, as you were saying, honor uh, our ancestors. So I'm very excited that you mentioned that. And talking also about how certain rituals or how we institute no? new rituals are also important. No? And I think what you're doing uh, with, the, with the interconnectiveness, with the... Um, the, the, the I, I was thinking, for instance, in in the Nkwe, no, uh, which is typical. The, this is drum from typical from West uh, Central Africa, and and I was thinking the reverberation, no, that the people feel that they could travel around um, miles and miles and miles, and I and I was thinking how important that those intangible uh, ways that we have to connect, no sound being specifically one, but also some of the things that you have mentioned that resonates not only with which you all do, but also what led to your work, which was to achieve that freedom, to aim for inventiveness and for some revolutionary uh, ways of doing. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to um, uh, have a break. Uh, there is a lot we have said. I hope you... Um, is, that, is that all right? I'm saying it right, right? We're going to have a break of 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, in case somebody wants to have coffee, relax. I think we're going to be around here if you want to approach us. But also, uh, as I was saying earlier, we will begin a conversation among ourselves. I, um, I'm looking forward to it because I think in some cases, apart from the fact that some of you have been in other <laughs> people's program, which is uh, what's so beautiful to see that we were not lying, no? this connection for over two decades is also there visible, or the admiration that we have for uh, our big brother, <laughs> this one and gone another big sister, right, or big sister, busy. Um, it's, it's palatable in some of the initiatives that we, we have had. So I, I think that there is a very beautiful dialogue that exists in the way that you had approach your uh, personal and your collective propositions which we will uh, develop a little bit uh, later. So it's um, four, uh, five past four, so we'll see each other here at 4.20, more or less. Uh, I'm very relaxed with time, but I guess uh, Ludovic is not. <laughs> so do as he said, <laughs> and come back in 15 minutes to join in. But I want to give a warm uh, thank you to our panelists in this first session of, the, of today. Thank you so much.
Just starting. Hello. Sí, muy bien. Para volver a entrar. Ah, wow. Un poco loco. Bueno, es lo que hay. Pero tampoco pasa nada. Y luego, sí, y luego después que, que, que la gente del público si quiere puede... Dale. Porque a mí me gusta muchas veces que tú sí, hablas sí, sí, y la gente te habla. Sí, 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 sí por no supuesto. Es... Sí, sí. Tenemos un micrófono para el público, entonces... Sí, ella, Andrés me ha dicho, ¿eh? uno vale. aquí y el otro aquí. Sí, sí, está ahí. Lo... ¿Y tú quieres que la gente diga su nombre o algo así? ¿Se está grabando? Sí, sí está ¿quieres que digan su nombre? De repente. I think we are still missing someone. <laughs> Do we know anything about our someone missing? How is everybody? How are you feeling? Good? Great. I want that energy when the, the time for the questions come. <laughs> I'm a bit bossy. <laughs> no. It's also the, the, um, the lecturer in me, you know, that, that also prompt people to talk. And as I was saying earlier, the idea is that we will engage in a conversation, but I hope that you will do so too. So we will go back and forth to the audience, um, so then we can actually hear your thoughts. I hope that when you do that, if you want, if you feel comfortable, and if it's pertinent uh, in your view, you can say who you are, what you do. And I would like to ask you to, can somebody take this photo of me, please? <laughs> it's, it's very distracting. <laughs> we, can have, we can have the photos of the old artists. Who was it? <laughs> we just are the center of the questions. No, so I was, I was saying that I will ask you, because we have until 5.30, uh, because we want to be, I think there is a sort of cocktail, or in any case, if there is not an official cocktail, we can uh, find each other in the bar after all. So I think for those of you that are more timid, that's the time when you approach the, uh, the speakers. So I feel like if we can be here together until 5.30, that'll be great. So then there is time for a much more informal engagement afterwards. Um, so one of the things that I... Hello, you. <laughs> One of the things that you all... I know, I know, I know. I know it's not your fault. <laughs> no, so one of the things that, you, that the, all of you have highlighted is the importance of um, pursuing, you know, like how I was talking about uh, this collective consciousness, right? Like there is something about that uh, that you that somehow is implicit in your work, not necessarily in, in the work that you do within the structure, but also in a way in the storytelling uh, that you that comes together with your practice, no? And, and talking about, I would love for you to talk about how you see. And some of you had talked about that, eh? and I'm not saying that, that you know, but in general, this is a question perhaps for somebody that felt that hasn't approached that subject. 
the how, what you do as artists uh, and what you do as, let's say, and I'm gonna use this for the lack of a better term that defines what you do, uh, institution builders. And, and I say institution in a way that you reappropriate the meaning of what that implies and create a sense of newness to something that perhaps we have inherited, but it's a new definition that you establish in your own terms. No? So as such builders, as such precursor, as such entrepreneur, as such creative minded, as such um, uh, sort of open, uh, uh, platform uh, uh, producers, right? How do you see what you do, uh, let's say, as individual creators, and what you do within these sort of collective pra uh, practices that you bring others with you as much as you bring the spectators with you with your work? And, and this is open to all of you, no? Uh, how you see those two things, those two uh, areas uh, working together? Do you want to start either? I see you lying. Ready and <laughs> um, I think one of the most reoccurring questions that I get in interviews is they ask me, why aren't you just an artist? Why do you have to do all these things? And I think in the context of Africa, um, this is not a journey for everybody. I don't expect everybody to take this on. But um, I think it's very important, the transfer of knowledge, you know? And in that sense, uh, it's not easy to be an artist and also to be organizing events and doing other activities. For example, for me, you know, I'm not an NGO, I'm actually a company, and my main conversation has been, how do we develop social enterprises? And that's, in a sense, what we are moving uh, ourselves towards. So in that sense, um, a lot of the times, um, because I have to create my own artwork, I have to move my artwork forward, and through that, actually what I've been doing is the, the prints that I sell, that money also goes back into my activity. And uh, it's not an easy uh, path within it, but um, through being engaged in all these different activities, because I'm also teaching photographers, besides just organizing the festival, I realized that it also makes me a better artist, it makes me a better photographer. And there's a saying in Ethiopia that your legacy is not about how much money you have in your bank account, but how many of those you have taken forward uh, with you. Because after you pass, it's, you know, who are the, those behind you that have moved to the next step? So in that sense, um, I consider what I do to be just an extension of my artistic practice. You know, uh, it's not something so far removed. It's not like I'm organizing a music event, even though I like to, but, you know, this is just... <laughs> Um, this is just an extension of my own experience. And then I think being, coming from the industry or coming from an artist perspective, a lot of the photographers understand that this is a collective journey. So over the years, the one thing that I say is that we're really building our own tribe of like-minded uh, photographers from around the world uh, and having these very important conversations and also engagement in order to move Africa into the, the frontier. And for that, even for my students, um, I try to make them understand the business of this industry because I think that's the biggest failure is that our institutions are not teaching us sort of what our rights are as artists. And also uh, what I try to teach them is also after me that they're teaching the next generation. So right now in Addis Ababa, those that I have trained are actually at a position to train. And this is the plan that I had that I, I calculated that if a photographer is trained well, within five years, they'll be able to train. So if you see the uh, Addis Photo Fest, you'll see that the guys that I trained uh, in the beginning are actually now the trainers. And through that journey, um, it kind of grows uh, the industry. And now it's, uh, we have a lot of photographers that have entered, even the, uh, the visual aesthetics of Addis Ababa, you know, when you look at billboards, the quality of images, that has dramatically changed. So, you know, the, the key thing in Africa is that our elder generations rarely support the younger generation. I don't know if this is a global thing, but this is what I noticed in my country. And I felt that we have to be that generation that's different in passing on knowledge because it's that way that there is more of us. And then that means that if there is more of us, there's different perspectives that come about. You know, I have, uh, you know, I still create my own body of work, but there's nothing more pleasing than to see photographers who have uh, found their own visual language and 
are showing me, they're teaching me a different way of how they see their own uh, realities. And for me, I tell all my students is that, you know, don't, don't aim to be the best in your country or the best in Africa, aim to be the best in the world because that's where we're heading towards. And the one thing I see about art coming from Africa, you know, uh, we're, we have been doing it for a while. So all of a sudden, you know, we are recognized now, but it's not a new journey for us. And my ultimate goal is that we are permanently in these different institutions and we are permanently in all these conversations uh, globally. Anybody want to add, Uh, uh Okay. Um, I think it was 1999. I applied for a residency at uh, uh, Delphine Foundation in London, and I received an email and answer back saying, uh, uh, "Thank you very much for applying, blah blah blah. But this year we are only interested in African artists." <laughs> so I sent her the map of Africa, and I made an arrow. This is Egypt. Just to tell her that it's Africa. Anyway, I didn't receive an answer, definitely. But, and two years after, or, or a year after, I, don't, was, I think it was 2000, um, I applied for the first time to the Dakar Binali. Actually, I didn't. A friend of mine told me you should do that, and I, didn't, I never heard of it. So I went there, and uh, um, uh, when, I, when I first sent there, the, 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 the guy called me, the director of the Binali called me, and it was one week after the, the, the deadline, and he told me, we are happy to have you. I told him, I'm sorry that it's still, I said, no, 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 don't worry. You're the first Egyptian to have. We would love to bring you here. So I went there and it was fantastic because I realized that this is where I should start. It's not Europe, it's Africa. And from there, I grew. So this for me means a lot and uh, it changed my life totally. Uh, and when I was in Dakar, uh, and these activities that I saw there, amazing activities, the city was like, uh, like uh, bubbling with all this. There's, you enter houses of people, uh, normal people, they have some w artists showing there and uh, shops and so, it was incredible. I said, this is what we need to do in Egypt. I mean, this is the most thing. So the whole thing of Darb started from there. I want to do this. This is something that should be happening in Egypt. We need that. We need that art is everywhere and to, and to be in every house and to get everybody engaged and involved. So uh, it was not, of course, now when I look at it, I, I said, well, it was fun, but definitely it was at some moment I was going to give up several times, of course. It was not an easy thing to, to give up. Even my daughter, at some, time, some point, she came to me and said, what are you doing? I mean, why? Why are you spending all this money? Are you crazy? I mean, it's like, uh, I'm your daughter. I, I, I deserve... I deserve this. I mean, why are you doing that to... to, to and uh, for me, it's like... Uh, it's something that I... I felt that art gave me a lot. And... And I... I and I feel that I, I need to give back something. And this is through giving this to the people. I mean, when you... Those who were calling Darb uh, a whorehouse in 2007, 2008, were the same people who protected the space when we were attacked during the revolution. And because there was no police, the, the same people who stopped the attacks, because there was a lot of people that who tried to, to break in and to take the whatever we have and to whatever. So those are the same guys. When, when, we, when I see myself, for example, having, uh, showing an, a young artist 
a, a dog for the first time and keep pushing her and then seeing her taking the prize of the Bamako Binali. Oof, this is, this is moves me. This is like, it makes me feel that, okay, it deserves. This is, this is the most beautiful thing. So the, my relation with Darb had become so emotional. Like I, I can't give up. I have to keep on going. It's part of my life. It's part of way of giving back the society. And uh, I hope it will continue this way. Cindy. Yeah, I think I'd like to talk about the relationship of the art, the, the artist that I am in relation to the project of the residency. And um, for me, it's really building bridges with, I mean, I think Sami and I are probably the only two that have a project in Africa, but are living, not in Africa, am I right? Sami, mean, you live in, in Brussels, in Belgium, I live in London. Uh, for you, the rest, I think you live actually where you've created your project. So it makes it quite complicated sometimes logistically to kind of move from one place to the other. But in my case, it was about building bridges and building a family, and the family was the Algerian family, the, the local Algerian family. And, and uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping that as much as they got from me, and I really agree with Bartolome when he was saying that it's about sharing expertise and experiences uh, once you, especially uh, done perhaps an art college abroad, and you know, and, and, and you are perhaps successful in your career or anyway exhibiting. So it's about giving back and sharing that knowledge. But it's also about getting. I'm getting so much from going to Algeria, from the stories I hear, from the friendship, the family friendship I've got. And uh, some of you know that my work is very much based around the family in any case. So, so for me, it makes sense. Um, it makes sense. So yeah, it's totally, totally kind of uh, connected and, and definitely inspires a lot, a lot my, my artwork. So it's not at all divorced. It's totally a continuity of that. That's what I wanted to say. Ouais, moi, moi, je voudrais intervenir à la suite aussi de, de I just Zineb, mais to aussi mettre un peu plus de la création dans, dans le contexte uh, d'où je viens, parce que situate uh, what I do in Bruxelles, j'y vis depuis in, 2010, in avec des possibilités de retour uh, au Congo. Uh, mais uh, au départ, j'ai je, je, voilà, toujours vécu uh, à Lubumbashi. But et, um, I always lived in Lubumbashi, uh, and it was from the noughties, 2000s, when the political crisis hit Congo, de, de and that uh, uh, we started to see the lootings uh, going on uh, over there. Uh, Que ce soit économique ou industriel, any property, industrial property or tout, cultural tout, tout property, cultural was endangered, and all of the cultural centers that existed at the time ended up being closed. Dans un espace complètement fermé. So I grew up in an environment that was completely closed off in some way, and that was because of the political crisis in the early 2000s. Quand on bien l'espace. Que ce soit Kinshasa, que ce soit but if you look at spaces in Lubumbashi uh, or in Kinshasa, il est, il est très si on it becomes collectif, very que, difficult to get out public, of being shut in without uh, une fois que tu la parole, a support, tu without es, a group. Tu es abattu, because tu es as soon as you speak up, as soon as you hit your, stick your head out, you end up getting attacked. Ou, uh, and this comes from uh, uh, the series uh, of le, colonial and dictatorial powers. So groups are very important because groups help us create a protective bubble. I remember that with the biennial in 2010, we would go to see the mayor of Lubumbashi and ask, ask for the permission to set up our billboards outside and the mayor would say, what's your budget? We showed him the budget and he said, Okay, but you give us 10% of that and you can use the public space to put your billboards up. There's a huge history of uh, things being banned, getting arrested for taking photos in public. We ended up having to get involved to get some people out. 
Et c'est pour ça que même la ville est devenue le sujet à la fois de mon travail. And this is why the city became the subject of my personal work. Because it's important to work on these ideas, these spaces, places where I come from. Because it's important to work on these ideas, these spaces, places where I come from. Because it's important to work on these ideas, these spaces, places where I come from. That feed into my work, but are also the environment through which I was able to work as part of a larger collective, as a larger group. And this is how we've been able to work with all of the commissioners who come to visit. It's difficult to understand this urban environment and the complexity that goes with it, and the interactions between the urban environment and a collective memory, which supposedly has disappeared but maintains a huge amount of influence. These are hybrid spaces where different powers are competing at an impressive scale. I think it's very important what you're just saying about the collective as not only something that you do because of the opportunity, not something that you do because of the chance, but also because of what it means to um, to break certain barriers, not to, to have the chance, as in the case, Dana, where you were talking about your project or some aspect of what Bartelemi and Moser were talking about, the, not only the context, but open it up that no, expanding the platform as much as possible, whether that means out of the region, whether that means beyond the African continent, whether that means in, in uh, sort of engaging in this global conversation, which I think are very important and we should go back to it. I want us to talk a little bit about also um, innovation, right? Because all of you, th there is something that I, I see also in some of your work, which has to do one with the organicity, something that happens in the territory. Picha is very much a space that is constituted by um, the expertises of the people in the collective. Sinev, you were talking about, you know, like having an, a, a, an empty apartment, so then that prompted, no? Uh, but also, as, as um, uh, Aida and others have been saying, no, the need to establish a different way, not to only create image maker, but also to understand differently the techne, no, the, what photography could bring, what uh, is intervening in, this, in the public space could be, no, what what sound could signify beyond uh, what we are used to, no. So I think it's important. I would love to for you to talk about more about inventiveness. Uh, about um, emerging with new technologies, right, or empowering and empowering people that uh, hasn't been using those techniques before, right? How how innovation is also part of what you do, uh, and 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 I know. I, I want you to understand me. It's not innovation because it, it presents new technologies. It's also innovative because it finds its way uh, sometimes through. Um, through what exists in the territory, right? For what it seems impossible to be generated from the territory. And I think that's where, and, 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 and sort of like making photography something else, when photography exists in a certain way, is such uh, innovative address. No? So I want I wanted you to, if you can, perhaps Dana, that's, that's also related to some of your practice in relation to sound, but also some of, some of what um, you know Bartolomé was saying in terms of agricultural project to getting uh, uh, that aspect of the work going. No? Um, well, I, I was thinking, I was struck by your um, your comment on, on photography and uh, the moonwalking exhibition that we um, collaborated with Guanza in, in 2014 um, could be uh, an example of, of this method, methodology. Um, we were uh, inspired, as I said, by Michael Jackson's visit in 1998 to Harare, and he actually came to the country to investigate economic opportunities. And we thought about um, how much the, the city had changed in the global imaginary since 1998. And there was an idea to offer alternative uh, perspectives of, of the city of Harare and perhaps others across the continent and create a 
pan-African imaginary over the city. So we, um, we thought, well, if this is going to be in a public space, in public spaces, um, where would be the most effective, or what would be the most effective moment to communicate an, Im um, an image? And we thought about the in-between spaces, waiting, spaces where people find themselves waiting. Um, so in doctors' waiting rooms, in um, hotel lobbies, in reception areas. And we showed uh, works by photographers from across the continent in, in over 20 um, of these spaces across the city. So I guess that's just, you know, one way of thinking about how, you know, photography can um, uh, connect directly with, with, with the publics and stretch this idea of, of um, the white cube. Mm -hmm. And then um, in, in terms of the radio, I th it had been planned for some time, and <laughs> and it, um, it there was this remarkable opportunity, and I think that's what is perhaps a characteristic of working on the continent: that one always has to be nimble. One doesn't just have one plan. There's plan A, B, C, um, and you you just make things happen. Je sais pas, je vais revenir un peu sur la question précédente. Um, well, I, I want to go back to the previous question de, about what de, de we expect, what is expected of us on the continent. Since 2015, I noticed that being present, being active on the land, on the continent, brought, brought more interest, more attention to the community, uh, to the people that we live with locally. If you can imagine, I would take an Air France flight at 11 from Paris, I get to Douala at 6 p.m. And the next morning, early, I have my boots on my feet, I'm dressed like a farmer, I have my machete in my hand, and I go to the field. And for the people that I live with, they, they cannot believe their eyes. This man living in Europe, um, well, compared to the other Africans from the diaspora, how, they, how we tell, how, how, how we present to the Africans from Africa, we have to be dressed in a suit all the time. No, I was in the field with my machete in my hand, and I noticed that this, this, this simple act, this simple gesture to be active on the continent, surrounded by the people that I live with, was much more appreciated, and they showed a lot of interest in it. When I leave my workshop in the 20th arrondissement in Paris, the next day I'm a farmer in Africa, and I'm more known in Cameroon as a farmer than as an artist. Personne so, jamais vu peindre, nobody has ever sculpté, seen me paint or sculpt. Le fait de venir leur donner un exemple, and uh, uh, showing them a, such a direct example coming from the West, it is il est dazzling. dazzling. Il est tellement violent. Mais the, it, the reaction uh, is violent, uh, but positively, but the, the result is welcomed. Je me suis dit, il faut continuer cela. Et and I thought, ans, I have to continue uh, this. Dit, and for the last five years, I thought, I have to be there every day with them, terrain, uh, leading uh, actions on the field et in Africa. Et ça, chose qui and that's something that really struck de, me de, 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 in this comparison de, de, de son between identity. application and change of identity Paris, in Paris. Uh, the, press the press calls me every day to ask me for images or to visit my workshop, Cameroon, see what I'm doing. In Cameroon, I don't even pick up a brush. 
ça, c'est ce qu'on on attend un petit and peu plus de nous, des really uh, gens de la diaspora, us, the from the diaspora uh, en retour. Uh, That's what is expected of us in return, coming to Africa, showing real-world examples, and people take this very, very well. And when I go back to Paris, in my 23 kilo suitcase, it's full of avocados for friends. And for the staff of Le Long Gallery, they received the avocados they planted in 2014 that have borne fruit six years later. They're succulent. Cette attitude. And this, uh, <laughs> this sort of it's such a beautiful, attitude. both uh, a beautiful metaphor and a tangible action. <laughs> Have like an uh, an incision in there. Sorry, what you were saying, Sunny? Actually, this is my microphone. You're having. A, yes, everybody has a mic. He's collecting. So he's collecting. No, but it's, I'm just being silly. I'm just saying you should. Perhaps you should have an exposition with all the fruits. I was saying maybe you should do an exhibition with all the produce that you grow. I, I will take part if you want. <laughs> I had to say that I remember this beautiful um, um, uh, watercolor that you have that are almost like landscape that you could actually harvest in it. So. <laughs> Maybe he's not so far away from that thought. Uh, I think we want to open the, the, the space for you and ask Andres and the colleagues that are helping us with the mics on the side to invite you guys to prompt uh, uh, questions that perhaps I haven't, I haven't made. Um, I'm going to continue a little bit more, but, but, I, but I want, if there is any burning question, we can ask it right away. Um, and otherwise, I'll wait until you warm up. You have had two hours and a half, for, by the way, to warm up, so. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that the, the, I always say that I know it takes a bit of courage um, to ask questions. I always feel like some kind of like intense nervousness in my stomach. And I know before I even think the, the, that I'm going to ask the question that I'm going to ask it. So I know that uh, where are you going through. And so please um, ask the question if you want. Um, there is no uh, such a thing as a bad question. Um, and, and this is the chance that you have to have these incredible people uh, beside you. I see that Simone is getting ready to it. <laughs> Break the eyes, please. <laughs> uh, just to give the example, I, I'm, I'm shy and I'm trembling. Um, there's a question I wanted to ask is about the distance. Uh, isn't it the fact that you are distanced from yourself, or you have this double bind, whether you're still living there or not, but you've been outside and uh, I mean, you see wider when you have that distance that to allow you to, to, to tackle the questions that maybe somebody who never been outside would not tackle because it's, it's just for them might be just a basic reality and a reality that they would not question and that uh, this double gaze may allow to question and to, to analyze in a deeper manner. I mean, I, I would totally agree with that, and I've noticed with Algeria, and I can only um, talk about the art scene in Algiers, is that uh, because they don't go out of the country, and they do come out from an art school, like many l'école des beaux-arts d'Alger, and the level is not top, but on the top of that, they don't see any exhibition, because there is very few exhibition, and they don't talk to anyone apart from the students that came out from college. So it's, uh, I mean, to me, as an artist, and I remember when I was an artist in London, a student, and I became an artist, I was, I mean, I was, I needed to see a lot of exhibition and share and discuss and with fellow um, friends artists, but also with established artists. But in the case of Algeria, and you know, Simon, because you've been there, there is a starving, the starving to meet others. And yes, it's important that we can kind of create some kind of community locally, but just that I think is not enough. It wouldn't be for me enough to just stay in London or to just stay in Paris. So I need to travel. I need to talk to other people. I need to experience and understand the experience of others, whether it's going back to the global south or going forward, or I don't know if I can say forward, but going more globally. But uh, yeah, I mean, in the case of Algeria, definitely the residency, what did uh, happen positively is that all those artists who were coming from everywhere were bringing the experience, sharing it. Each of them bringing their own eye, their own expertise, their own taste, their own... And, and you could see after that some of the artists in Algeria were kind of 
changing suddenly. The, I can think of three or four artists who totally changed their practice. They started a painter and suddenly they became, started looking at the archives and making installations or whatever. Not that I'm saying it's better than painting, but it's true that in the art school in, in Algiers, it's probably like a lot of art school in Africa, it's very much either photography or painting or sculpture. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really go beyond that. So yes, for us, uh, coming from the diaspora, definitively we bring also that. I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, and also uh, going back to what Bartholomew was saying, the expertise. I get emails almost every two weeks from a young artist in Algeria who's asking me to look at his CV, help him with his CV, or his portfolio, because he's applying to something. He's not sure to put the right image or the right text, the right credit. So I'm still doing that, and that's not even part of ARIA, it's just me. Me and my family, really, you know, it's like, a, and sometimes it is tough because as artists, we have our own practice and sometimes we period where we're very busy, some period less. So depending on that, the, the project for me anyway, Aria suffers. Mm. Each time I'm very busy, Aria will have, will suffer from that because I will do less. I will give less. Mm. I'll be less available. But also that's, that's another important question, no? The, the, the wave on you, no? The, like you all have been very generously speaking about how important it is to give back. You talk about the example of your daughter, no? Asking why. I, I think there is, there is also so much pressure in the leadership that you have, that you constitute. I mean, I know that's why you highlight the, the, the sense of the collective, no? But how can we work towards a new, uh, institutional models that make possible that people like you go forward, but then you don't um, have it at the expense of the of the the way that is put on your shoulder, right? Like, I mean, some of, as you say, uh, some of you are, and all of you have been willing to take that uh, on on your care, but I wonder how can we instore um, a sense of continuance to the kind of legacy, you know, the, to work around that, to, inst to uh, perhaps even, um, as you were pointing out now, no, that there are so many other elements. It's not only the production of uh, photography, as you also had done, I know, for a fact, in Desta, either, no? like it, it's about also how you yourself, how to make a pitch, how to present your work in a portfolio, how to present yourself on a, through a grant, right? how to create a collective, how to make an institution, right? There is so many of the spaces between the production of a word or, or learning to produce a work and then making it on display. What are the other professional spaces? How are we going to, to fill them in with, um, with other professionals? No? How, how do you think that we should start thinking about that? Challenging the status quo as it is without um, you know, in, in the case that there are no people like you bravely taking this on board for 10 years or more, what do you think that we should tell people that perhaps are looking at us? What is it? What the model that is projecting for it to be sustainable? I think funding, I mean, when I hear the Montels or even you, or we all putting our own money towards it, it's kind of quite shocking, I think, you know, because... Uh, you know, we are artists, we're doing not too badly, but you know, sometimes we can't, like uh, Montasse, we've got uh, children, we've got a uh, mortgage to pay, whatever. So, I mean, in the case of Algeria, the problem is like, I don't know how you do guys, you know, having some um, private sponsorship in Algeria that doesn't exist. No, 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 there is lots of rich people, but they won't put any money into the art. And of course, the state puts some money into the art that they produce, but they would not never give. So we always go back to the French uh, Institute, the French Embassy, the Italian one, sometimes the German one, depending on the artist. But it's awful. And that means that the project cannot be sustained because I cannot hire local people all year long. I have to do it each time there is a residency, so punctually. And it's, it's awful. So that means the project is always on the verge of possibly collapsing, you know? And I'm always kind of trying to pull string to make it work. And of course, I'm not whinging, complaining now, because I think it's part of the thing. And when you do something in the continent, uh, often it's a case, and, and, and it could be also interesting sometime, mm -hmm. but it's exhausting. I mean, having to fund, we artists, we have to fundraise on the top of that. It's like, you know, we all know that the artists, we don't like doing those things, you know? And anyway, I'm gonna stop complaining. <laughs> Uh, actually, also, I, I, I need to... Uh, you raise a very good uh, topic because I think we also are lacking working together. It's like... Uh, 
It's whether, uh, I mean, if there is not this little binalis, uh, not little, but I mean little by number, uh, that's happening that brings us together, or the, or the effort of a person like Simon, it's one person effort going around the continent from here to there, trying to bring people together. But we, ourselves, we are not really like uh, col col work collaboratively and we, we exchange our uh, experiences. And even when it happened, it's happened, I'm sorry to say that, forgive me, but it happened by Europeans. Like Art Collaboratory, for example, it started from Europe and now we are 25 country, uh, country uh, uh, culture center from all over the world. And, uh, and from there, I learned a lot. Of course, I learned uh, with, with how, to, uh, how to raise funds, how to, uh, uh, even my accountant have changed totally, my way of accounting, uh, learning from them how they, uh, they, they are doing it. But we need to exchange this knowledge between us. I mean, I mean uh, why do we wait waiting for someone from outside? Um, I, I don't mean outside, outside but Simone is not from outside, but I mean, why are we waiting for, for, for others to come? Why don't we just initiatively get together and start to work together? And I, I, actually, I, I, for me, I'm saying it loudly, I need you. Uh, I need every one of you. I, need, uh, uh, I, I was happy, for example, when Aida, for example, she offered to come to, shoot, to, to give a solo show at Darb at the very beginning to support the place at the very beginning of the openings. Like uh, it was just, she was the third or the fourth ex ex exhibition there. That was fantastic. Uh, uh, I, this is how we should work together. We don't need to wait for someone to bring us together. Let's. Uh, uh, Let's exchange, let's move, let's, uh, l uh, let's see how, if, if you're funding for yourself, why don't we fund for, for each other? Mm -hmm. Let's do some projects together, let's work together. I think it's, uh, there's a lot that we can do when we are together, then when, when everybody is working individually. Why we apply as, why will I apply as DARB when I can apply as six strong foundations together? We can get more and we can even work all together and we can do something. I mean, it's, this is still missing in a way. And uh, it's, uh, it's clear and we don't have to, to, to hide it. It's, uh, it needs to be changed. Sami? Um, um, I, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about how to create a structure as an individual, but I would like to pick up on what Simon was talking about, the distance of, uh, and the sense of belonging of two places, to two places. This distance in and of itself is a privilege, but it's also factual. And it's a fact that remains because of the system. We always talk about the problem of education that makes things worse. We said that uh, in some places uh, art history stops at Picasso. Uh, we talked about Algeria or Congo with Romain de Fossé or all these uh, ways of uh, training, of educating, and also the powers that are in place. As soon as they feel uh, fragile or attacked or threatened, they can be very violent in their reaction. Or if you speak up and they do not feel concerned, they just leave you like you're trash on the side of the road. Unless you're dangerous, and then they will squash you. I think it's uh, impossible. Des parcours, uh, I think these are uh, journeys un, un, un ensemble, that uh, make a whole of information, uh, information uh, that has to be uh, put into place. Exemple, que, uh, de, and de Pichage, uh, this is why, for example, uh, with Picha, I always say I'm co-founder, the co-founder, and it's a collective, but how can we take on our responsibilities to make something happen, even if it sounds like a utopia, or if we disagree, or egos clash for any given reason? 
But justement, l'individu, déjà, comme je le disais, tout à l'heure, n'existe pas. It doesn't exist, as I was saying before. Even the community, the community doesn't really exist because to make a community. The individuals need to take on the responsibility and be uh, be uh, responsible and accountable. Uh, but the system is already damaged, and the individual has to feed himself and live day by day. So, and the government does not help. So, I. I just wanted to. Say something uh, to Mortaz uh, that has les, les his wish for the arts uh, centers nous, in Africa to collaborate, to collaborate together. We already do this. Bandrun Station uh, uh, invited uh, the Kenya Art Studio. Uh, uh, the contemporary Samira, art space in Essaouira from Rost Mustafa uh, Romli, Villa Gottfried, Villa Gottfried de, de Mansou, six, uh, Mustafa Mansou, Tanakasi in Dakar, and other places like the unique space Dominique Zimpe, of Dominique Zimpe. We all are. With the, the center in Cairo, Ida's project, or Sami's project, we all are still young. Can you imagine that we officially started in 2013? And in 2013, we already worked with eight African places. It's a lot. We have no budget. We have no grants. Et donc nous sommes encore au début so we are at the beginning euh, en 2013, of our existence. Well, we were in 2013, but we had already started working together euh, with uh, places that were already set up. Et so we are a young group. And given the work we had de, de, to de do, en collaboration, we euh, euh, Gonefal, qui est we already ici, worked témoin, together a lot. Uh, you know what we have had to, we were able to do in Montpellier, and it's Bandun Station who started this as a partner. So we are at the beginning, and we will keep working together with Egypt in the future. And I think that we have to give it some time, and it is a great idea. To help each other, vue, and I agree with you. Route, but we are on the right path. Just uh, mm -hmm. début. And this is only uh, the beginning. Merci, uh, I don't know if either you want to uh, respond directly to that. Otherwise, we have uh, a person in the. So we're gonna hear either, and then I'm gonna go back to you. Thank you. I just wanted to to uh, quickly say that. Um, I think that the key thing for me and one thing that I've noticed is sort of the, uh, I hate to say this, but the archaic way of the foreign culture institutions. Um, I work pretty much with everybody. Um, and you know, the, the key challenge for all of us is not the project, it's the administration and having a self-sustainable model in order for us to grow our entities. Often foreign funding does not support administration. It only supports uh, either the foreigner that we're bringing based on the country or the actual activity. And right now, uh, I think in Africa, there needs to be a new conversation with the foreign culture institutions on the fact that whether we want to accept it or not, you know, we are selling ideas and commodities. You know, th there's no, uh, let's not be delusional of the, the financial aspect of it. Um, so to me, I'm not, um, you know, I've, I've worked with everyone and eventually I've had to stop working with certain uh, institutions. And then I realized that working with corporations was actually far more interesting because um, corporations did not put sort of limitations on what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And not to say that I'm not happy with the, the funders that we've had in the past. Uh, you know, when we started, really we started with nothing. But over the years, um, the self-sustainability model is what we're looking for in the continent. And in order for us to be self-sustainable, we need training, we need inputs, and even what I told one foreign culture institution is that we need able workforce 
uh, from outside to come and just to support us on just basic things, you know. If I cannot afford, like you were saying, if I cannot afford to hire somebody for a year, there's plenty of young people living abroad who have studied, you know, art in Africa or have this passion for Africa that we need to sort of create these connecting points to come and train our people. And knowledge is such a huge resource. It's not, for me, honestly, it's not just about money. Um, it's, it's really about how to build a system that succeeds and continues to grow. And that requires sort of uh, outside and inside engagement. So from my end, I mean, yeah, we deal with uh, corporations in our country, um, and we've dealt you know, heavily with governments and so forth, but the self-sustainability aspect is, I think, where we're all uh, struggling in. And even if we got funding just for administration for one year, imagine, I mean, that's where the innovation comes in on how we need to create a different funding stream outside of just waiting for money to come from outside. But we're actually offering something that has value that our own people are willing to put the money in. So I just wanted to say that. And uh, before you go, uh, we're going to hear somebody in the public, Dana, unless you're responding directly to this. I want to just to mention, uh, Ida, that while you were responding, you were thinking of the archaic way in, this, in, in which the funding normally operates. And I was thinking in what you were talking about formation and deformation, Sami, you know, like th there is something about new engagement, a new conversation about funding, what is there to be transferred in terms of knowledge and expertise, and I think that's an important one. Um, Dana, do you, do you want me to, to is that, do you want to respond directly here, or otherwise we will hear yeah. somebody in the public? Yeah, it's a, it's a thought. It's, it's not uh, directly about the funding, but it, again, it just speaks to um, the ecosystem. Okay. Um, of, of artist-led uh, um, initiatives. So I'm just looking at the, um, the document and there are um, four that are listed here. There's Animal Farm, by, um, Artist Residency by Admire Kamtengerere. There's um, Mbare Art Space, which is a new uh, space. Um, uh, formed by uh, Moffat Takadiwa, there's an Njilele Art Station, myself, there's Village Unu, which is Gina Maxim and Mishik Masamovu and Gareth Nyondoro. Um, there are others, there's um, Zimbanete Interactions Trust, which is run by Chiko Chazunguza. Um, there's Tapfuma Gutsa, who has a sculpture park, it's outside Harare. Anusa Salange has recently said that he's starting a residency, Calvin Dondo, who, who does um, Gwanza Month Photography. There's the Zimbabwe Female Photographers Association. Um, Ami Mpalume, who's part of that, recently started a mentorship program. Um, there's Harare Art Fair, um, which has just been started last year by Richard Mundaraki. And um, Clifford Zulu is starting a space in Bulwayo. And the reason I'm bringing all these up is because each of these uh, different initiatives um, hones, focuses on what they would see as perhaps as a void. And so when you weave together this tapestry, I would say that, you know, it's it manages to sustain and fill and, and support um, a lot of different types of uh, artistic practice um, from education through to um, uh, printing. Um, so maybe that's one way one, one can uh, think about it. And perhaps it's, it's happened organically in Harare. All these artists see these needs and, and, and they fulfill them. And that's beyond uh, thinking about funding. Thank you for that. We had to, you had to take note of all of this <laughs> for your initiative. Um, please, go ahead. Um, hello. So I was just wondering, because when you were presenting your projects, there was, uh, Ida, you were talking about uh, bringing Africa to the global stage, while uh, Barthélemy, you were also talking about keeping uh, and fostering and nurturing uh, African art in Africa. And I was wondering if maybe uh, in all of your projects you found those two movements 
uh, that are supposed to, I think, uh, in, in theory, compl compl be complementary. And instead, uh, sometime it was a struggle to balance them and they were instead opposites because of uh, maybe the, um, the fact that the perhaps African governments didn't help and the view of um, African art in the West and how those uh, outside forces were making these movements instead of being complementary, being opposites. And if you had like thought about balancing those um, movements and like goals of bringing Africa to the outside and also keeping and fostering African art in Africa. Me, like I said uh, earlier, is that we, we cannot deny the reality that we're living in a global world, you know? Um, to me, the best exhibitions, and this is my ultimate goal, is not to be exhibited in only the context of Africa, you know? Uh, I want to be exhibited in the context that my work is global, you know? So, uh, so in that sense, um, for example, we did a large installation of about, I don't know, 30 photographers in the Sharjah Art Museum in the UAE. And I know that was the first time for the audience to have seen uh, images of Africa that had nothing to do with zebras and giraffes and what have you. You know, it was a different reality for them. And we got a lot of comments uh, about it. And just as um, we're developing the talent on the ground, we also have to get the talent to showcase outside. And it's not about showcasing always in this fantasy of going to Europe or to the West, but we also have to showcase across the continent. And I know Simone, when he came to Addis Ababa, the first thing that he asked the students was, what festivals do you know in Africa? Nobody had answers. What photographers do you know in Africa? Nobody had answers. So when I teach, I mean, yeah, of course, there's the uh, usual suspects in photography uh, that we all have studied. But I teach specifically with photographers that are in the continent because the continent is already rich as it is. So it is a balance between that. That's what we're focusing on. Uh, you know, I think just as he has explained, you know, we've shown in Dakar Biennale, uh, in Bamako with my own financing, I've taken a collection there. Even most recently in the 2019, you know, uh, I uh, presented a collection from the Addis Photo Fest inside the Nobel Peace Prize exhibition. So I work very systematically in that sense. But we also, ha you know, the one thing that I find quite sad is the, uh, how do you say this, the, uh, the brain drain that happens uh, often for Africa. Um, you know, a lot of artists get picked up by European galleries and then they think, going to Europe or wherever, me, I, you know, everyone has their own path, but I feel that we need to find ways to keep that talent in the continent because we need those individuals also to, to teach the next generation, you know? So, uh, and this is not saying the challenges in Africa are, they're enormous, you know, there, there's a lot of things that we have to, uh, to deal with, but within it, I'm, I've chose for my life path to stay in the continent and to do this work um, but even, you know, when I, when I exhibit globally, if there's an opportunity, I'll take other photographers' works along with me just to introduce the audience to that. And that opens up a whole uh, window. I mean, there's still people discovering my work, you know, uh, and I find that quite fascinating to enter into places that people don't encounter the style of work that I do. But we have to work in a way that uh, it is the reality of the industry. You know, it's, it's not uh, just being cocooned within your own world only, and it's not only looking at the outside and only waiting for the outside to come in. So that's how I work personally. You know, I, I try to engage on both, uh, both ends. And in this way, it also shifts the, uh, the photo industry. You know, uh, a lot of the editors that come to the Addis Photo Fest, they're quite unaware of the massive pool of talent. So when they're looking for photographers to give assignments to, um, now they've started looking at what we're selecting. And through that, then all of a sudden, photographers in different regions are able to get work from these international publishers because they have the access on the ground. So we do need our photographers also to be on the ground because that's, uh, that is the witness to the changing history of our times. So if you live abroad, obviously, you, you, you can't have all of it. But 
I mean, we have somebody like Simona on outside that helps us on the inside. You know, this is how we've been functioning, I believe, you know. Oui, euh, la première idée dès le début de ce projet, c'était de réaliser que, que, comme je l'ai dit au début, que la classique n'était pas sur le continent African classical art was no longer in Africa. If you go to the Tergerine Museum, you've got 10 million African masks and paintings. In France, you could go into, you could go to Germany or the Cape Horn in Paris. All of this was taken from Africa and taken to the West. When a contemporary artist like myself who's traveled around these expos, realizes that there's an issue with where our creations are going. Because today, I am in Tate Modern, for example, in Beaubourg and elsewhere. But no one has a Togo in Congo or Cameroon or DRC. We should make a priority of building a place in Africa where we can share with my African compatriots. And we want to be able to show the biennials in Valencia, in Busan, in Venice. And we want to bring that work to Banjun Station as well. Je sais pas, il n'y a peut-être pas un chéri samba au Cameroun, ni, ni, Because ni au Bénin. A, a et c'était dommage pour moi. Et la priorité Cameroon de Banjoun Station était d'avoir un station espace où les œuvres des artistes africains vont African pas être dans un ghetto avec les artistes africains, mais à côté de leurs confrères internationaux. Artists, et j'ai eu la chance side by side with de d'accéder à la, la collection de la galerie Le Long qui m'a cédé des artistes que je ne pouvais pas les atteindre parce qu'ils étaient loin, mais aussi certains collectionneurs et des galeries ou d'autres artistes, and comme je vous ai dit, et opened the doors to other galleries David, and other artists. David Lynch, David par exemple, Lynch, exemple que j'ai rencontré à la rue Montparnasse, who I met in uh, dans, Montparnasse une, in Paris. dans un centre d'édition où uh, we met a a, uh, publishers where um, Picasso on the 53 Rue de Montparnasse worked and David Lynch gave me 30 works for the projects in Cameroon. And having that alongside African artists also helps make sure that everyone is working towards the same African goals because you've got African artists alongside some of the great Western artists. Faire des concurrences avec d'autres lieux. We're not here to compete with other venues on the continent. We're completely different from what you might have in Addis Ababa, in Lubumbashi, or Cairo. And each venue is individual, each venue has its own concerns and priorities. I'm fier de savoir que tous ces artistes, Miro, Today I'm very proud to know that Orland, Miro, Lynch, and young artists as well, not some of the most recognizable names, have a presence in Africa. And this raises the issue of conservation as well. We need to find how to train our people so they know how to preserve these works that are on paper because we live in a humid uh, region. Anything by Louis Bourgeois, for example, could get damaged over time. And that's our main concern at this point, more so than competing with other African art venues. To make it so that the African creation is at the same level. We want to make sure that African creation is held up at the same level, if not more, than um, how some Western museums are seen. We're very happy and proud to see that in spaces like Banjoon Station, we've got Louis Bourgeois, with Samba, with Atsupé du Togo, 
être dans une That's idée de concurrence avec un autre espace au Togo, au Bénin, en Côte d'Ivoire, et chacun a ses objectifs et notre Everyone's objectif, c'est surtout le fait que les artistes africains soient, restent un peu sur le continent. Moi, je ne suis même pas African dans artists un, je suis pas au Sénégal, je n'ai aucun artiste du, 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 du Togo, je n'ai jamais vu un Togo Senegal, près no, de... Uh, no contre, uh, uh, actuellement, à Bâle, il y a du Togo qui traîne dans Togo. le couloir de Bâle. Mais vous voyez des Togos réels dans des places en Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go to two people in the audience that want a third person I see here. Um, we start with you and then we yeah. take the other two questions. Oui, bonjour, euh, je m'appelle Dora. My name is Dora. Euh, justement, moi, je réfléchis à des modèles économiques And euh, I've been thinking dans différents about domaines. J'ai fait business dans models in various fields. I've aujourd'hui, looked at business euh, models in fashion. Faire dans le domaine And de l'art. today, I would like to work aujourd'hui. on business models Alors, for art. And that's what I'm pour doing moi, vous here êtes today. Nos héros. You are our heroes. You shouldn't be ashamed of anything that you do. What you have been able to accomplish on the African continent is amazing. I've seen a lot of things being tried, and what you've achieved is truly fantastic, be it here or in Africa. And it's important that you stay free, because your initiatives are vitally important. La saison Africa, c'est qu'il y ait un avant et un après. What I would like as part of the Sinon, Africa 2020 season on a une mise is en for there to be a before and an after. Currently, we've Moi, got a spotlight on us si thanks to Louis Vuitton ce, Foundation. Cette mise en lumière après cette saison, I would like to know si if that spotlight, if that support is going to keep être, uh, going vous, after the Africa 2020 season. Pour pouvoir soutenir vos initiatives. Ça, c'est la première Et ce que j'aimerais parler, c'est de solutions et de développement, en fait. La représentativité, c'est essentiel. Because representation Je pense. Is Very le fait de ne pas avoir de pavillon qui regroupe par exemple vos initiatives à la Biennale de Venise qui est sur le Jeux Olympiques de l'art, le, le fait de ne pas être exemple, là, ce n'est pas une question de fantasme hein, de dire on est à la Biennale. Mais ce que je veux dire par là, c'est que le fait de ne pas être représenté, de ne pas exister de façon pérenne, même s'il y a eu des initiatives... The fact that, although there were initiatives, the fact that there's no kind of sustainable representation, I think Simon has been working on this with some things, but it's important that that representation be recurrent, be permanent, so that your initiatives get better. No, no, what about some kind of shared flag that would fly over all of your initiatives. This is important because in Africa, indeed, you are doing a lot of work. C'est une question de popularité. Moi, je veux être très cash. It, it's a popularity Il faut que vous contest. Let's be honest. You need to become popular. C'est la célébrité qui compte. Today, Comment se fait-il que, à l'heure de, de la pandémie, le monde a How besoin d'artistes Comment se fait-il que, pendant la pandémie, le monde a besoin d'artistes Comment se fait-il que, pendant la pandémie, le monde a besoin d'artistes Comment se fait-il que, pendant la pandémie, People, Les when they think artists, think singers and think actors. We don't hear from the actual artists. In a very concrete sense, we're lacking economic clout. It could be the UAE or China. All countries understand the economic relevance of contemporary art. Contemporary art is an art form that should speak to people that should get close to people. So your initiatives are not only social, but they can also be uh, political. But what you have in common is your commitment to your causes, because you're all activists in your own way. What's important to me is that art is a business, like sport, like music, or whatever. When Barthélemy shows his coffee, it's not just coffee. The sugar road isn't just the sugar road. There's a lot behind, a lot of meaning behind that. When you write a book on humanity, I think that 
Well, let me put it this way. Through your work, you can touch the entire world, and I think your initiatives have a lot to bring to the table at the worldwide scale and also smaller scales. D'avoir une visibilité qui puisse donner beaucoup de de crédit à ce que vous faites. What about visibility that lends credibility to what you do, so that people can understand how important what you do is. What's the point of being a contemporary artist? Why is that useful? That will create jobs. That will improve society. That will help uh, working with people, help make working with people easier. But if you don't become celebrities, if you don't become known, I don't know how we can achieve that. I believe that you, through what you do, should be better known than Beyonce. And to see Beyonce in the Louvre is abhorrent to me. We should be using the same technologies as mainstream celebrities to get you known because you're more important than them to me, although we're not here to uh, compare each other. I don't know whether you're going to continue support after uh, the Africa 2020 Louis Vuitton season, but celebrity is not your enemy. I don't think so, at least. I think you should be better supported in what you do. And just to finish, I think that there's a lot of potential in a platform that would bring together all of your initiatives, because I learned for the first time about some of your initiatives. So maybe we could develop some kind of a platform or solution for cross-fertilization. And I'd just like to say that you have the respect of everyone here in the room. Thank you so much. You, you, you raised a couple of good points there. We, we are um, reaching to the last five minutes of the conversation. And I think there are two people that want to talk. One person here and then another gentleman. First him? Okay, go ahead. Bien, je vous remercie. Je suis Yandi. Thank you. I'm Yandi. I'm a plastic artist. I'm from Côte d'Ivoire. What I notice. What I've seen is that it's very enriching to see how these projects were born, in which context, and uh, especially what are the motivations of all artists present here today. It's very motivating for us. What I wanted to bring up as a concern, or also a question, is for us who work in the continent and have the privilege to travel, these projects, how do our artists who start the projects, how do they project themselves in the collective conscience of uh, uh, African populations, uh, Congo? Congolese people, Cameroonese people, the, way, the places in which uh, Africans grow up and become the leaders or the politicians of tomorrow, the deciders of what will last, what will be long-lasting and what won't. How did we conceive of these uh, projects to go into the collective conscience so that tomorrow political leaders will not be as hostile as us so that they can embrace us. How do we make this durable and long-lasting? How will these projects behave? How will, we, will they be kept up? And what will be their place in the collective conscience of these societies for which the projects were created? Even though this is great for young creators, and we're very glad to have this, and we would have loved to have this when we were starting out, but for now we are glad that these projects exist. So bravo to my peers and to our elders. Um, so that was my question. Because we I always talk about this, but I don't think we've heard about the opening of these projects for the African populations and how they can grow along with this. So that was my concern slash question. Great question. I don't know if we should take the last question and then allow you guys to respond to all of that. Oh. 
parle. Yes. Hello. Euh, donc je me nomme Christine. My je name is Christine. Je suis artiste et I'm an artist. Je, je anime un atelier as well. en fait avec I, euh, des I jeunes. I run a workshop with the young people euh, in uh, underprivileged suburbs and I decided to create a documentary en fait. speaking et about how to live together in the Ile de France region. You have to know that 54% of young people in Ile de France are mixed race. So we, we took them to see uh, the exhibition at Quebranly uh, and at Conciergerie. Um, even one where Mr. Togo was there, uh, one of the, they were thrilled. But one of them asked me a question: What what does this have to do with us? That's, that was the question. And he's a mixed race kid. He does not understand the link between France and Africa. So I said, Well, I will ask. I will ask uh, the artists uh, who are at the event. Would you be so kind uh, as to explain to them what Africa Vava uh, is for? And uh, this, uh, this festival is geared towards young people. So if you could use the words that they will be able to understand, if you if you if you can, please. Questions to I think that those were the last two questions, and and I think we don't have time for more. So if you want to respond to the first or the second, it's up to you. Dora, <laughs> um, there's a big difference between uh, visual arts and performing arts. Um, visual artists, I believe, uh, create work because they have something to say, not because we want to be famous. That's my, uh, my take on it. I agree with you that there needs to be a sort of addressing the business model of the creative sector. Right now, what's happening in West Africa is there is a systemization of the fashion industry in order to move uh, fashion from Africa into the luxury brands. So these kind of things, it's, there's already several activities that are happening uh, within that. Granted, uh, the luxury industry and also the fashion industry, it's, uh, it's a mass, uh, it's selling to the masses, you know. So there are these kind of things. Uh, if you're interested, I can show you some projects that have already been launched within it. As it relates to like, when you were talking about more people need to know what we do, I think a lot of people know what we do. Um, this is how we're able to get the support for us to even be here is because we've done the difficult work of pushing it throughout the years. But if it's something that really interests you within the visual arts to support us, the most simplest thing that you can do, for example, is make a manual of how to set up your business model for a creative sector. And I don't know if you've read, there's a paper by Ernest and Young, uh, which Angela Kijo was part of the uh, the initial, she was one of the ones that was leading it. But if you just look up creative sector, Ernest and Young, Africa, you'll see a document which actually puts a numeric value on what the creative sector from Africa, what is the valuation of it, the formal valuation, which at that time, I think 2016 was $34 billion. So there are these kind of studies that have been done, but where the disconnection happens is for artists, for those that are cultural entrepreneurs is, there isn't enough material in the virtual world to follow through with it. So if you're interested in something like that, I would encourage you to, to create something that is available to those, you know. Um, in regards to your question about um, our work is in Africa, and I, I don't know if you, you came a little bit late, I remember you walking in, but I had specifically <laughs> said, <laughs> I had specifically said, uh, and I live in Abidjan now, so I know your country well, but I had specifically said that my interest is my people. When we do the Addis Photo Fest, we're not only doing it in Addis Ababa. We take it to the ruler parts in order to engage. And this is how the numbers of photographers has increased. Me, I'm not an elitist when it comes to photography. I think if you're a wedding photographer, if you're a product, all of these forms is valid. But it's just to create an industry that goes far beyond of what we already have. And if you know across Africa, studio photography has been the, sort of the bread and butter but there's many ways to engage uh, within it. And I think the same goes for Amata. I, I think everybody here is engaging our people um, because that's the whole point that we're in Africa doing this work. And when you talk about the next generation, me, I'm only looking to inspire one person. That's enough. 
amongst 100 people, if I inspire one person to take it to the next step, then I've done my work. That's all I need, you know? So, uh, so within that, and that's why I said, the legacy of all of us is not us being great artists. It's not about that. It's about those that have, we've carried next. And I believe Moataz was talking about in Bamako when he sees photographer winning an award. I mean, it's a very fulfilling experience uh, for us. And then, um, I didn't have an answer for you. That's all I, that's, that's all I wanted. Anybody else? Um. Yes, I would like to answer, but I think maybe Barthélémy, Barthélémy should answer this. I would like to answer this question based on an experience in Brussels. And I want to give two cases, two examples that are very obvious, and I will not give any names, but I know somebody who is mixed race, who is older in Belgium, whose father is from the Congo and the mother is from Belgium, who studied African languages and the language of his father. And when uh, she was at school, they told her that the, the Chiduba was a dead language. But no, it's not dead. It's still spoken in the Congo today. But at school, she was told that it was like Latin, that it was dead. And this brings me to the other case. Between 1908 uh, up until the 1960s, and this is why we can't photograph in the public spaces in the Congo without having to pay a bribe to the authorities or without having a permit is that there is Infopress Congo, which is a Belgian uh, press organ, which was supposed to be the only agency allowed to take images in the Congo for a colonial propaganda. And that shaped the image of what the Congo was uh, from the point of view of Belgium. And these two examples bring me to my point. This colonization has a double edge. For the people in Europe, the diaspora people, they are completely cut off from what is happening elsewhere. And it also brings me to what we said about Simon's question, the question of mobility, migration, um, and everything that that entails. And I think there's a lot of misinformation uh, for people from the diaspora communities who are here in Europe who are disconnected and have very little information uh, except for those who are lucky enough to travel. Very little images uh, to be uh, to reconnect with this aspect. But on the other side as well, there are very few cases that can um, go outside of the country and travel. And the only places where we can access un, culture, one very last example, uh, we had this example in Belgium where we could create a cultural center for the diaspora. It raises a lot of questions because you have the representation of these people in the institutions and in the places that are supposed to represent all the communities in a way. So I think I stayed a little vague, but I think I answered the question. So I think we had reached with this almost like a declaration for a certain visibility and representativity of of all the stories. Now, one of the things that I, I, I recall something you said at the beginning uh, in building this community, what, uh, I think it was I that what we activate is the individual voices of the of the photographer, no? Like in, in this this sense that togetherness doesn't imply homogeneity but heterogeneity, no? That that all these multiple voices, all the visibility to possible avenues, stories, um, are are clear uh, part of that. Um, I think we don't have time for more. I just want to thank again Dana, Mozart, uh, Bartolomé, Aida, Sinev, and Simon. Uh, sorry, Sami. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I was the only one that, that, that didn't mention you as part of my, my uh, life, but you see, it had to come and in the unconsciousness. My, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
fire my psychoanalyst because it's not working. Um, Sami, of course, my brother, but also, of course, Simone and, and, and beautiful and gonna fall, uh, extraordinary work at the abroad. Not only these, but I don't know how many South End events to, as you were saying at the beginning, uh, give the possibility to people to engage in a dialogue, to make certain practices, certain aesthetics, certain traditions, certain histories, to be here in a different way, to be understanding their own rights. I will be uh, very uh, ungrateful if I didn't say thank you so much to Ludovic and to the colleagues in your office that have helped to bring us all together that had uh, supported this reunion to the Foundation Louis Vuitton for having us here and for initiating what we hope it will be just the first step into something else. Uh, it is provoke us uh, was somebody outside of the context, but very much engaged with it. But we hope that you will be heard also by some of the actors and agents locally. Don't, so, so some of the um, missing, uh, 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 let's say, organizations, collective institutions that are not part of this yet will have a hub, will have a space, a database or something, a, a wiki world to connect with. Uh, without um, continuing this litany, which is like two minutes and I'm getting dry, I need some water. I um, encourage you to uh, please I, I, uh, help me to give a warm, warm farewell to all these fabulous, um, extremely, extremely uh, hardworking, thought-provoking, um, better human beings. <laughs> Uh, that we have had the pleasure to share the afternoon with, uh, to whom I love and respect um, enormously. Um, thank you very much for your expertise. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.